recording. Mm. And I'll be able to hear everything that comes from uh, Discord. Uh, it'll get captured by the recording. So, uh, yeah. All right. Um, I guess we should probably introduce ourselves. I'm uh, I'm using the name Nat right now, um, and I'm kind of, <laughs> I guess, the person that put this Discord and this uh, discussion group together. Um, I use uh, Zay pronouns, um, and uh, if we just want to go, I guess we'll start with um, Asadia and work down the the list uh, as it shows up in the voice channel. Uh, sure. Introduce yourself and your pronouns, and if you have anything else you want to say, say it. Otherwise, yeah. Cool. Um, I think it's pronounced Akedia, uh, but I have never actually heard it pronounced, so I'm just going to go with... <laughs> Anything anyone feels like. That's nice. uh, and pronouns are they, them. And that's it. Is the next person exit here? Hey, hello. Uh, just call me exit. Uh, I prefer either masculine or neutral pronouns. That's it. Um, Iris, she, her. Uh, my name's Jamie. I use she, her pronouns. I am a, I, I'm involved in kind of like Deluso, Guitarian kind of studies. I'm very interested in the schizoanalysis of madness, and I do some research into that area. Um, and that's all for me. Remind me uh, after this, Jamie, I actually have a, a friend who uh, is really, he's a psychology graduate student. Um, really into that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, fabulous. That would be great. Yeah. But, um, uh, hi, I'm Yvette. Uh, use she or whatever pronouns. <laughs> All right. Yvette, word. Okay, so that's everyone. And we're here today, obviously, to discuss the first, um, I guess, two or three chapters of homosexual <laughs> desire, depending on uh, I, I guess we'll probably want to discuss uh, Guy's, um the introduction he wrote to it. Because it's very short. It's only like two or three pages. And I, mm -hmm. I thought it was quite good. Um, yeah. But the sort of, I guess, idea that I had for how we would sort of structure this was um, we'll all sort of... This is based off of the reading group that I go to... Um, in, in the real world, uh, we do Whoa. sort of, uh, yeah, I know, I do things in the real world. Um, <laughs> we do uh, big thoughts before we discuss a text where we just sort of go around and share uh, what our sort of biggest takeaway was, the thing that really stuck with us. And then sure. we're going to go through and do a sort of uh, bit by bit reading, uh, I guess, page by page. And um, I was thinking we try to time wise keep this to no more than like an hour and a half. So uh, sure. I will just kind of watch the clock because that uh that reading group I go to in real life we never make it through the entire text, and I would really like to uh, actually make it through all of this. So uh, we'll allocate me like fifteen minutes for big thoughts, fifteen minutes for the introduction, and then thirty minutes for each of the chapters after that. That sounds um, good. Yeah, so uh, big thoughts. I'm just going to kind of go down the list of names again. To And uh, if you guys have big thoughts you'd like to share, uh, please share them. Uh, Asadia? Um, I think I'm going to skip this because I'm still kind of collecting my thoughts. So no. not really sure what to say yet. That's fair. I know you were in the chat. You were reading it right up until... Uh, <laughs> I did finish. Okay. I did finish. Yes. Good. Congratulations. Um, exit? Uh, I don't know. I'm not really good with those things. <laughs> Pardon. That's fine. I'll just pass. Next one. <laughs> All right, Iris? I set a bad yeah. precedent. Okay, so the introduction is just short and wasn't that... I don't know, interesting to me, but the first proper chapter, it's like, it doesn't seem to be saying a lot that's uh, like radically new exactly to me, but it articulates the kind of 
like this idea of paranoia and of repression of homosexuality in terms that I'm familiar with from stuff like anti-Oedipus. All right. Yeah. So yeah, for that, like, I don't know. It just, it doesn't seem to be radically new material yet. <coughs> I, I mean, obviously the time scale's a bit weird because it's from way back when, um, but um, it's, like the most clear enunciation of this that I've read. Can I uh, make a direct response to that? Is that all right? Before oh, yeah. we please, please do. Yeah, this is very loose. The format I okay. was kind of um, yeah. Go for it. Uh, so I actually wanted to know because, like, uh, you know, so my background's mostly in like philosophy and things like that, and I thought this was kind of a really, uh, I agree with you that it was a very Sid and to the point defense of, you know, we haven't gotten to the meat of the text yet. And it's very clear that this is still like introductory material, even to the third chapter. But um, I thought that this was pretty, I haven't at least read, I mean, it might just be because I'm not extremely um, versed in queer theory very much, um, but um, to me, it seemed fairly unique. And uh, I, I'm interested in hearing what you think, like kind of are the shortcomings or where it's not as like inventive because I thought this is pretty um, interesting. I haven't read any anything like this exactly. So just, you know, to Iris, just wondering what you think is kind of like um, not, you know, not uh, inventive. Um. I suppose, like, I think of things in the progression of what I've personally read. So mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem new to me exactly, but this is from 1979 or whatever. So, like, everything I know is probably from after then. Um, but um, I don't know. As I guess things like the specific examples it gives of use of repressive apparatuses, like legal stuff, um, mm -hmm. they, like they don't directly relate to what, like where and when I am. Although I think that um, you couldn't really argue that uh, like queer repression has somehow slowed down in any way. Mm -mm, I agree with you. I will. Yeah, I guess the thing that I found very, oh, I'm sorry, go on, Matt. Oh yeah, I just wanted to jump in real quick because um, this sort of respond to what you were just saying, Jamie, about, um, uh, and also sort of, uh, I guess maybe, I guess just sort of share part of my uh, my experience with this book, which has been so. I originally came to this book. I found it um, through that reading group that I mentioned that I go to in real life, um, which uh, we they were doing a module on queer theory, and uh, so I joined in. And it was kind of my first time reading queer theory, but we read a lot of the sort of you know big names, like we read Edelman's No Future, we read uh, Cruising Utopia. Um, what else was there? We read some Halberstam, The Queer Art of Failure. And we read a lot of those, and um, it was kind of interesting because it seemed like it was, you know, sort of, there was this kind of cloud that I think connected all those texts, but it was kind of, that wasn't just queerness, it was, there was something else there, and it was kind of, it took me a while to figure out what it was, and um, I, I think that the answer is that it's this book, because I think, mm. um, maybe it'll become more clear when we get to the later half, because I think that's where you see it more, I think that like, um, I've said, I think Cruising Utopia, No Future, Queer Out of Failure, those three books are basically like book long explications of like ideas that uh, Hook Weem gives like a page or two towards the end of this book. Um, Can I jump in? Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, I, I was gonna say. believe it is. Uh, my, Hook my, French, my French pronunciation is not very good, but I believe it's uh, Hook Weem. Uh, okay, all right, that's I was good. thinking we should have just a counter of different types of mispronunciation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. Him. Yeah. Um. Poking him. Yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that I think uh, jumps out at me is like just kind of slaps me in the face is unique. Is I mean, there's such to me a dearth of schizoanalysts out there. Like I think, it, and I think it's a very powerful uh, method of analysis. And uh, for for schizoanalysis to be applied to sexuality, specifically homosexuality. I think that that's um, very interesting that they, that um, Hoquiam, ha, what, what is it? Hoquiam? Hoquiam. 
Hokuyam. Uh, I think it's really interesting that Hokuyam compares this to, um, you know, how the Liz and Vutuari, like, would talk about how um, capitalism produces the subjects that it needs, and that they're doing, ex he's doing exactly that in the book about how, like, uh, um, on page 89, uh, he, I marked down the thing, it says, the homosexual exists, first of all, in the normal person's paranoia, the judge knows him to be guilty, just as the doctor knows him to be sick. Almost like paint the homosexual as this kind of like outlaw society in general. And to me, that's the sort of thing that makes it unique is like in this particular capitalist society, um, it's the homosexual is always on the fringe like of all these kinds of like in the, <coughs> the context of the penal system in the context of the medical um apparatus and capitalist society uh it's almost like the homosexuals always already excluded and to me that's kind of what makes it unique and you know as i say i'm very not queer theory is not my forte so i can't really um say but it seems to me that that is a fairly unique take on it at the very least um if I might just like jump in real quick, since I kind of like formulated what I was thinking. Um, one thing I noticed a lot is not that I didn't think it was original, but that I think that a lot of the ideas in it have sort of come to already permeate. Like for me, my like experience of the discussion around these ideas. So it's not that when I was reading it, I thought that they weren't original because I have no idea where those ideas originated. I just sort of found them already reflected in what people talk about now. And so a lot of like mm -hmm. what he said was like prescient in, in, a, in a few senses. And I'll kind of like get into that like later when we go over certain parts. But I do find that like a lot of the stuff he talks about is still very, very relevant and perhaps like more relevant now than it was then. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'll get to that later. I'm, I'm, I just want to say right now, I'm so excited for y'all to read. I think we'll probably finish this book up next week because there's not that much left in it. Um, I believe, yeah, sure. but um, we're halfway through. Yeah, but um, the the second half of this book is, I think that you'll all be, it gets it gets pretty good. It, you'll you'll really like it. Um, I want to spoil it. No spoilers. No, for definitely the, not for the theory book. But um, um, yeah. No, but I, I that's I think that that sort of uh reflects what I was talking about earlier. Um, Asadia with uh regards to yeah like how sort of you know this is really i think where i i mean hokuyam is sort of sometimes called the first queer theorist and um i i think that's appropriate because i think that a lot of queer theory does just sort of like explode out of this book and uh kind of yeah it sort of uh metastasized itself about the uh the hokuyam hokuyam's ideas at least the ideas that he is presented in the first half of this book yeah. Um, um, something I'm interested in seeing is how, like, they took these ideas and then applied them to, like, because this is mostly, and he acknowledges this, it's, like, mostly about male homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'm kind of interested in seeing how people took that um, and kind of, like, applied that to, like, for lack of a better term, female homosexuality. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's something I'm kind of interested and in exploring. There is some of that in... um one of the other books that I hope to read eventually, um, the, uh, the Scribble Asses, he talks about lesbianism a little bit. Um, again, like not a ton. Um, I'm sure we can find some good text on that to read uh, when we, after we've finished this, because uh, I would personally, hopefully keep this group going, but um, also just yeah, keeping yeah. an eye on the time and trying to move through. I want to make sure we get to everyone for big thoughts. Um, Jamie, do you have any more big thoughts? Um, well, I mean, the big thought that I really wanted to explore was pretty much right what I said um, in re responding to Iris about um, that. Uh, I thought it was extremely compelling when uh, Hokuyam was talking about um, it's not just the homosexual vis a vis the heterosexual, but also the homosexual vis a vis the normal person. I thought that was uh, really very um, interesting and uh, just the way he describes it very potent. Um, so, um, you know, nothing much more than that. I kind of uh, elaborated on that a few minutes ago, but that's probably my big, my big, big thought. All right. I guess um, my big thought, the thing that stood out to me um, a lot this time that uh, 
I guess I probably did notice on my first read through, but it didn't leave quite an impression on me as it did this time, which was um, uh, Hukuyam starts talking about um, desire uh, by way of Deleuze and Guattari, their concepts of desire. And uh, that really struck, struck me because I think, um, because they're sort of talking about, and you have in the Freudian sense, desire as a, an absence, as, a, as something that needs to be filled. Whereas right. Deleuze and Guattari and Hukuyam as well, sort of see desire as this productive force um <laughs> and uh that was something that, that that stood out to me and reminded me of uh Prashado, who i referenced in the group chat earlier uh, i think we'll read his introduction to uh this it, it was originally he wrote the introduction for the spanish edition of homosexual desire and then that introduction was translated into english but um in Prash one of Prashado's other books testo junkie he talks a lot about um he, he has some kind of reformulates the idea of like a, a sexually productive desire and he has some uh some pretty interesting stuff to say i think so uh i'm excited to get to that but uh, i have a question um, for just kind of a general question that i think might be you know broad not to anyone in particular mm -hmm. um it was very it's kind of difficult like because hokuyam doesn't really have a uh, much of a wikipedia article at all um i was wondering if anyone is aware of the kind of, someone mentioned it a few minutes ago, of the people influenced by Hukuyam. Like, uh, I know a minute ago you said people regard him as the first queer theorist, but I'm not sure if anyone has any information to who precisely he was influential to. Is, is, is it so that he isn't that influential in uh, maybe psychoanalytic circles, or is it specifically queer theory circles right i would say i because he is kind of this weird sort of it, it, it is strange I, i'm i i honestly haven't quite figured it out either yet where um the reason why you don't see his name as often as you would think given i mean one i think how good this book is but then also just um but yeah i think a lot of the ideas in it kind of did go on to become big I think mm -hmm. I've seen him in the in like the references in um I want to say in Halberstam books I want to say I've seen him in the references in Edelman books I want to say I've seen him in the references of um Prashado. I mean Prashado obviously uh name drops mm -hmm. him a few times I came across him actually in a uh I think in a Maggie Nelson book once possibly I'm not 100% sure um I but I seem to remember that <laughs> Um, Interesting. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'd I'm be not, interested in having. I'm sorry, go on. I was just gonna say I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in exploring those names you mentioned. But uh, all right, I'm sorry to interrupt everyone, but that's that's oh, all. You're fine. Uh, Yvette, do you have any big thoughts you'd like to share with us? Um, I guess kind of. I'm not really like familiar with theory very much, but um, I thought it was interesting when I think he said that uh, the kind of psychoanalytic or psycho more <clears throat> uh, not necessarily psychoanalytic but the kind of community therapeutic as a whole uh, kind of subverted Freud's official or original thesis it kind of made it more homophobic I guess I don't know if that makes sense but I think that was in there no I yeah. might have just misunderstood it no I, 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 I think I think that's definitely true because um yeah, I mean, I mean, Freud's attitude towards homosexuality is definitely very interesting. And I think, I mean, obviously, Hokuyam doesn't think he gets it right, but I think that he views it as sort of being the important starting point for his project. And, um, mm -hmm. and then also the sort of misinterpretations and misappropriations of Freud. Um, oh, but um, this was just a, a small thing I want to sort of addend to my big thought, um, unless, does anyone want to respond to Yvette or... Yvette, do you have any other, um, anything else you would like to add before I go back and add a postscript to my... No, you, you're you good. Okay, so, um, um, oh, sorry, it's the idea. Yeah, just one, one thing, I think there was, like, a, specifically a section, like, contrasting the whole, um, chromosomal, like, explanation of homosexuality in, like, psychoanalytic theory and the Oedipal explanation and how he sees sort of the chromosomal, chromosomal one as like almost a regression from the from Freud's like Oedipal kind of explanation. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of how I read that. 
a lot of that chrom chromosome like section kind of went over my head a little bit. I wasn't certain. That was definitely a strange section, and I'm not 100% sure what to make of it. But we'll we'll do a close read when we get there, and hopefully uh, be able to sort it out. But I guess the the sort of postscript that I wanted to add to my um, my my sort of uh, thought about the desire as a productive force was that if we go back to um, he's talking about he's comparing it with Marx, and he has this uh, he talks about Marx, you know, sort of realizes that labor is the source of all value, um, and then. Uh, goes from there. Uh, and I was sort of thinking about, um, I don't know how many of you have like taken an economics class, but I remember when I took uh, economics in high school, uh, the sort of, you know, mantra was how to satisfy unlimited wants with limited desires. And that's sort of uh, thinking about that in as with limited what? unlimited wants with unlimited wants with limited resources. Sorry, I think I said limited desires, <laughs> limited resources. Um, but I was thinking about that as sort of this uh, analog, sort of the, the liberal economics that get taught to us in uh, the United States mm -hmm. high school system with uh, Freud as sort of, I guess, what uh, Hukwim would probably call the, the sort of liberal psychoanalyst. Uh, sure. If you don't maybe, mind, I'd say like, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say making um, economics about uh, uh, sort of satisfying this absence rather than production uh, can verse to, uh, it, I guess, sort of analogous to. And that might be an inappropriate analogy. Yeah. I thought it was kind of... Actually, I think it's actually really interesting because the genesis of, like, Freud's psychoanalytic theory sort of, like, is uh, sort of... I don't know how to say this. It was co-temporal with the development of neoclassical economics. It would, like, kind of happen around the same time where... Around 1890, there was a turn in economics away from classical political economy to uh, the like sort of marginalist theories, and so that's sort of like concurrent with the time the timeline of uh, Freud's like sort of intellectual development. So I think that is something that we can certainly like kind of think about. I, I think also, if I can add to that as well, um, I think that that's precisely like um, what Deleuze and Gattari focused on in Anti-Oedipus, because um, there was that big trend in, you know, the 50s, 60s of critical theory and everything, um, with the Frankfurt School kind of talking about Freud, Hegel, and Marx kind of in the same breath. But I think that, that the biggest takeaway to the way that uh, Deleuze and Gattari thought in, through Anti-Oedipus was that it wasn't a castration, but it was rather um, a, a surplus of desire and that things function like machines. And that led to, you know, all the rest of um, that mode of thought. But I think that follows perfectly in suit to the way that they were thinking um, in the Oedipus. All right. Well, um, does, if, unless anyone has any sort of last big thoughts, I think we can move into oh, the introduction. Yeah. Uh there's a thing that's kind of been stewing inside of me or something, um, <laughs> which is like, we see these sort of progressions of uh, Hawkeum from uh, like Anti-Oedipus from Freud. Um, and all of them are theorizing things based on kind of specific case studies or evidence of some kind. Um, and then the same sort of thing applies to, like, in economics, Marx and Marx's many successors and successors of successors, and then, say, anthropology or whatever. Um, but, like, I don't know, this might be something other people have thought about before, but it seems like somebody influential will have a particular kind of case study that they write about, and then everyone after them has to repeatedly, uh, like... Uh, Iris. Kind of... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so there's a great example of that in Marx. He makes fun of, like, the classical economists for constantly repeating the sort of analysis of, uh, sorry, uh, what's his name? Uh, the yeah. one stranded on an island. What's his name? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Robins, Robinson Caruso. Yeah, that's it. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, Is that you meant someone that actually see, existed? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, um, sorry, I'm collecting my thoughts. Okay, Robinson Crusoe. Uh, classical economists tend to sort of repeat this um, analysis of Robinson Crusoe's like, own production stranded on the island ad nauseum. 
And so in the first chapter of Capital, Marx sort of makes fun of this and uses this sort of example against them uh, to make an argument for communism instead, which I think is interesting. And if we want, we can, I can sort of like pull that section up later on when we get yeah, to it. That but, would be good. Um, like I think like there's sort of, there's like uh, baggage that accumulates around specific cases. So say um, anthropology, like I was reading this, I was reading um, on the economy considered as a form of black magic or as black magic from Kikan recently. And it was talking about Malinowski and uh, just kind of reanalyzing Malinowski's research, uh, which like, I understand that it's useful to do that, but uh, like if Malinowski's opinions are relevant and, or incorrect in a particular way, but also it means kind of assuming that whatever actual case study or you know whatever real thing it's based on is correct or representative in some way and then the same sort of thing um might be happening in that hawkwam talks you cut out a little yeah bit. you cut out there she's gone silent everyone I oh my god oh no can you hear me Yes, oh, I can hear you now. Yes, okay. we do. Sorry, my phone disconnects sometimes. Were you going to okay. say, um, uh, talks about the uh, Schreber, thing. Schreber, yeah. Yeah, as does uh, mm -hmm. Anti Oedipus. So, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. if it's just talking about the same thing Freud talked about and then talking about somebody else talking about the same thing, oh. it's like it, it can just slowly get detached from the actual reality instead of bringing up new cases. That's really interesting. No, that is interesting. I think that's something we should keep in mind. Uh, yeah, certainly. Because I will, well, we'll get to Judge Schraber uh, in chapter two, I believe, is where he features most prominently. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if we're all ready to move into the introduction, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So um, <coughs> the way that this normally works uh, at the the meat space reading group is just sort of uh, we kind of sit in silence for a few minutes and then uh, and stare at the page, and then one of us will be. We'll come across something interesting and uh, say, "Oh, uh, what were you guys thinking about with this?" So, can I, can I vote against that just because this is going to ultimately go on YouTube and yeah. we're going to send it to everyone else? So, can we cut those silence, parts out? Right? Um, we can either cut those parts out. Um, oh, we can do that too. That's it doesn't. True. It doesn't take very long for someone to find something interesting. Um, <laughs> that's fair. But uh. Well, I can bring up something right now yeah, from I mean, the first page of the introduction. Yes, please do bring something up. Okay, I'll um, read it. It's just a few lines. Um, it's the, the, the final paragraph on page 49. He says, homosexual desire, the expression is meaningless. There is no subdivision of desire into homosexuality and heterosexuality. Properly speaking, desire is no more homosexual than heterosexual. Um, yeah, that was very striking to me because he... Um, he, it, I mean, it almost directly reflected what I uh, really read into anti Oedipus. Um, he was almost, it occurred to me that he seemed to liken homosexual desire and heterosexual desire as like the Liz and Gattari's like perception of Melanie Klein's, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, partial objects. And so, which is to say that they're like parts of a uh, something larger that is cut off by, um, that is cut into flows and skitzes, and which is, you know, homosexual, heterosexual desire, but it isn't really anything that's a whole complete object. There's, there's no, heterosexual desire is just kind of a colloquial term for something that is uh, bigger and unnamed as he kind of like just quotes Foucault a little bit later he says like something about naming the unnameable um, I thought that was extremely um, interesting and that really struck with me the first time I read the introduction yeah um, I think <clears throat> yeah and I mean I think if we if we read on you see he um, uh, desire emerges in a mul in a multiple form whose components are only visible uh, a, pos a posteriori, according to how we manipulate it. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. sort of, um, a, a posteriori is the sort of uh, by reason rather than by experience, correct? 
Am I getting that right, or is it the other way around? I never really read Kant too closely, I'll be honest. Fuck, let me double check this. Because <laughs> I was thinking it's by reason. Um, oh no, it's by As opposed to what? Uh, it, oh, it's, a, it's a priori the, the after a the thought. Yeah, it's um, right. a posteriori. A posteriori is um, uh, denoting reasoning or knowledge that proceeds from observations or experiences uh, to the deduction of probable causes, rather than um, uh, a priori, which is uh, from Latin, which is to say mm. that uh, it's or, or not from Latin. What the fuck? It's in Latin. From reason um, <laughs> means something that you can sort of uh, deduce without. Uh, the, the famous example is uh, all bachelors are men because you don't need to physically see a bachelor to deduce that it's a man. It's right. inherent within the built thing. into the concept. Yeah, it's built into the concept. Whereas, so with right. um, the division from uh, into homosexual and heterosexual only comes forth in our uh, experiences of, I guess, living in this uh, world, which is um, right. Yeah. I it seems to me that he's describing the t terms heterosexual desire and homosexual desire as constructions of society specifically, not something that's it, like, I'm reading that correctly, I guess, Matt, like that's uh, desire in general is maybe more of a universal, but heterosexual desire specifically and homosexual desire specifically are social he says, constructions. He says desire emerges in a multiple form. So it sort of suggests this sort of like, infinite like pol polarity mm. in a sense yeah it's um if we um, if we if we go back to freud it's a, a poly polymorphous um right and this, and and so go ahead well i was just gonna say i mean this is also in in deleuze and guattari that um desire is sort of this undefer I, I always think of it just like in my head as kind of like a one of those like you remember like those like uh sort of uh like like toy like uh, not not quite Plato, like a little bit slimier than Plato, but like one of those, but like with like a similar structure to Plato, we can kind of, I guess actually Plato is probably a good kinetic example. sand. Yeah, like maybe kinetic I, sand. I or love Plato. that shit. Yeah, where it's sort of like <laughs> desire is just kind of like, uh, just kind of like thing, and you can sort of prod it or poke it into sort of forming the uh, particular shape that might be useful to you, and or your mm -hmm. your desire can be prodded, or um, I, I'm not sure how anyone would feel about localizing desire to an individual, but that's a whole nother argument to get into. Um. Well, that almost seems to me because like, at least the first three chapters, like it focuses exclusively on homosexual desire as such. I'm almost wondering what, I'd almost like to see what he would think about desire in general more broadly because it seems that he has a conception of like what he takes to be desired specifically but he you know the second and third chapter have they're strictly dealing with homosexuality um i wonder I think, like, yeah we need to be talking about like the sense in which he's using the word desire because i think it's not that it changes but that it has a lot of like forms that we, we it, it appears in in the book and That's it's true. sort of hard to figure out how they're related for me in a few senses but yeah, no, well, I, I think that's, yeah, it, that is kind of, because we do, we do kind of, th this introduction does sort of seem to, uh, I, I, it's almost like a sort of, uh, like, pre-corrective, like a keep in mind, as I'm going to be talking about homosexual desire, that homosexual desire is not this sort of, it's not, it's, homosexual desire isn't a metaphysical thing. Desire, I think, to dilute, to um, hoquiam is probably metaphysical. Um, to Deleuze and Guattari, I think desire was absolutely metaphysical. But yeah. um, to uh, but I think that to Hokuyam and I, I expect Deleuze and Guattari would probably agree with this. Um, de desire was sort of this uh, uh, homosexual desire and heterosexual desire were this sort of uh, uh, I don't know. I I, I, I want to say like social constructs, but I, I feel like it's they they these sort of social concepts rather than metaphysical concepts. You said homosexual desire specifically? That's what you're and, talking and about? And heterosexual desire. The, and heter the sexually differentiated okay. desire. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah, even yeah, sexual yeah, desire yeah, yeah, at yeah. all. I think, like, because we, we... I don't even know if we should be talking about desire as purely sexual. It's just that in this case, we are talking about desire as how it manifests sexually. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I think that was yeah, what I was... Um, that was what I, I sort of was trying to get out with that okay. last 
that but of course, it's it's not even just in like explicitly sexual manifestations. Um, it talks about like I assume we're well, like homosexual desire is changed in particular ways. Hawkwim talks about like to create things like male camaraderie. Um, Anti Oedipus talks about like uh, the perverse homosexuality that must be recognized when men get together to like choose wives and stuff. Um, but it's like, it's uh, the distinction between these two areas of desire, heterosexual and homosexual are not characteristics of the desire itself. They are an imposed system of categories. Yeah. I think that's definitely true. No, I, I think that's very much correct. So uh, I'm not sure if it would be appropriate to read, um, you know, I, I assume later he does get some analysis more with homosexuality, but uh, I'm not sure if it would be appropriate because he quotes um, Freud far more than he cr- quotes uh, Deleuze so far. And um, to, to, to like take uh, the Liz and Gattari's conception of desire uh, as the same way that Hawkwiam would define it, because I think it's clear that um, in Antiedipus, they're defining desire as a product produced by a desiring machine, the unconscious, right? Um, which is their you know way of saying it's it's a partial object. Um, of the unconscious, but d- d- was that would that be appropriate to the way Hakuyam uses it? Do you think? Or I don't. Th- I don't think that that would be in. I don't think that would be in in contradiction. But I don't think it would quite get at. Well, hmm. because I think because this is one of those things where we're kind of hitting at like I, I sort of think of desire, um, the desire that he's referring to right now not the desire that he's going to be referring to throughout the rest of the book. I think that that desire is going to be very much in line with the Deleuze and Guattarian uh, conception of desire as the, the product of the desiring machine. But I, I think here he's hitting at the sort of what you were saying with partial objects earlier, sort of the, the thing behind the partial object. The, mm-hmm. if, if I'm understanding the concept of partial objects correctly. But I, that's the sort of, um, I guess, what the desiring machine uh, takes as its sort of starting material and what it shapes into the uh, what it shapes into the the uh, blah, the um, I guess uh, affective desire, maybe like the experienced desire. Oh, okay, I see, um, I see. Like the the undifferentiated. Yeah, sort of like, so the, like yeah, pre precognitive almost. Yeah, the undifferentiated like pre like the, 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 the moon desire, the moon sand desire. Okay, okay, yeah, um, I can see that. That's my reading, at least. Um, Okay, uh, just like looking at the clock, we have already spent about 10 minutes discussing the introduction. So um, moving through the introduction, uh, unless there's, is there anything else people want to talk about about that little passage we sort of zeroed in on uh, from page 49 to 50? If there's nothing more, we can move onwards throughout the rest of this introduction. I'm fine with that. I'm okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, d- I did. I was a little uh, perplexed by the um, the uh, the quote here. Not it, this is probably this is actually irrelevant. But um, the problem of homosexuality hovers over society like a ghost or a scarecrow. I <laughs> oh, I love that. The scarecrow yeah, imagery. The scarecrow imagery confuses me, man. <laughs> And yeah, I think one of you said in the group earlier that the specter of homosexuality haunts Europe. Oh, yeah, awesome. that was that was me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it haunts society. <laughs> but uh, no, and I think that is sort of one of the. Um, but yeah, I I, I think that this sort of to go back to what you're we just talking about with the desire, I think that, that sort of is. Um, uh, it, the Hukwiam prefaces this homosexuality haunts the normal world. Um, right. He's, you know, uh, I, I think if we go back to, to Freud, yeah. you know, we think in Freud's conception of things, the sort of sublimated, uh, I, I think I'm using that word correctly, the uh, the anal st- stage you 
transcend the you you go through the anal stage and then you you mm-hmm. sublimate your anal eroticism and that becomes your sort of ability to socialize. Um, is that is that correct in Freud? I'm not very. I, I believe so. I'm, I'm not also Freudian. Not super like versed on that, but I believe sublimation is like the moving past the stages okay. sort of and concept. Yeah, and I believe having spoken with people who know Freud I, that I'm getting this more or less correct, but if I'm incorrect, someone will yell at me in the YouTube comments and <laughs> probably call me about just slurs too. Um. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> well, we're all there with you, probably. Um, but, um, In its endless struggle against homosexuality, society finds again and again that condemnation seems to breed the very curse it claims to be getting rid of. Where are you reading that? That's uh, from towards the bottom of page 50. It's the second to last paragraph after the block quote from Adler. Okay. Uh, And for a very good reason, capitalist society manufactures, moving on to the next paragraph now, manufactures homosexuals just as it produces proletarians constantly defining its own limits. Homosexuality is a manufactured product of the normal world. This statement must not right. be taken in the liberal sense as equating the homosexual as a defense and assigning the guilt to society, a falsely progressive position which turns out to be even more ruthless towards homosexuals than open repression. Nobody will ever eliminate the polyvocality of desire. Um, that, that sort of, that bit about um, the, the liberal sort of re- repression really struck me as true because the, it reminded me of something I read from my philosophy of law class where they were analyzing uh, someone named uh, Wilhelm Bonger, um, who is a Marxist criminologist. And so he talks about uh, how in the future that crimes, instead of being sort of like remedied by prisons would be remedied by a psychiatrist and so that sort of sent like a bunch of alarms <laughs> ringing and i'm like hmm it, mm. it sort of reminds me of this whole idea that like instead of like sort of saying that it deserves like punishment and discipline and sort of um any kind of like harm done and, and retribution it's sort of a it's still a sort of restricting of persons like autonomy anyway it's a still a sort of a form of punishment and control but it's it's done under the guise of sort of liberal care and um other sorts of like do-gooder rhetoric um that's the most from a thousand plateaus the most recent figure of the priest is the psychoanalyst Mm, yeah right 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 that's exactly right you know i think that's also kind of a classically Foucauldian point too you know when he just when he discusses power and the way power functions um, he discusses power as you know there's a more classically imi- classical image of violence and power of you know like murder and uh, brutal repression through force but there's also the more um, contemporary liberal um, idea of power and violence that's the disciplinary you know, structures yeah the dip- the, precisely right 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 there's like so, and that's you know, very true as well there's like the I, there's sort of a whip discipline of the factory in sort of like sense of like the managers of the factories almost treating their their workers as slaves, and then there's the sense of like um, these sort of subtle um, psychological manipulations done in order to in, try to entice people uh, to work harder through guilt and like all these other so- more psychological and subtle mechanisms, um, and so obviously in the end it comes down to property is still protected by actual like police repression but that they attempt to avoid recoursing to that through other means and i say they it's sort of vague but i mean in the sense the state um and whoever is responsible for protecting property all right so we now have spent 15 minutes on this introduction so um i feel like we've covered the important things in the introduction i mean we really covered the first two pages but then after this it's sort of he spent a lot of time like going in on Kinsey and I don't think any of us need to go in on Kinsey. I think that's kind of a, (laughs) an easy punchy bag that we have pretty much already covered the important ideas in the previous section, uh, of, of why Kinsey's a fucking moron. Um, (laughs) but, uh, yeah, yeah, um, so we can move into, uh, yeah, we can, we can move into chapter two, anti-homosexual paranoia. Um, 
yeah uh, you know it's, it's kind of a good um segue right talking about um the way that uh, homosexuality is repressed by society because this is all about how homosexual homosexuality is society. specifically often he mentions the penal system really really frequently but um that's exactly the entire upshot of this chapter to me is how there's this like <laughs> uh yeah iris mentioned that you said it the 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 specter of homosexuality haunting society right that's the entirety of chapter two is there's this fear of homosexuality which is not the true face of homosexuality that um scares uh, quote-unquote normal people right oh and, yeah that's and, kind uh, of funny because the way in which marx uses the whole specter metaphor is not actually like that he's talking about the real face of communism he's talking about this sort of um the use of communist and all these other kinds of like relations to it as an epithet and a way right. to attack political opponents. So I, I thought that's sort of an interesting parallel. It is. Yeah, there's mean, definitely very, very like good. this uh, distinction or like this, I don't know, sort of paralleling of the, like uh, the created homosexual and the actual homosexual. So the characteristics um, such as the spontaneous sexualization of all relationships with a homosexual, um, um, like that paranoid, mm. does every gay person like me thing. Um, I hope so. Then, <laughs> then later on, stuff like, uh, where's the bit about murders? Uh, um, yeah, homosexuality and crime, how this created homosexual is also criminal and prone to, or just does murder by nature this right. constructed person is completely different from like just actual homosexual people. And, you know, I kept thinking of when he was talking about uh, this kind of constructed, like when he discusses, um, I think it's in this chapter when he talks about the homosexuals who would treat, uh, seek treatment specifically to cure their own homosexuality and how much like, uh, the social fear of homosexuality has been integrated into their own minds. I kept yeah. thinking of uh, Kafka the entire time about like just this massive just fear of uh, bureaucracy uh, that's just that's uh, the manifest in your own actions just seems so similar to me and especially with you know his discussion of the penal colony uh, his discussion of the penal system, I think of this book in the penal colony, which I thought was a really interesting parallel as well. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, that's, um, yeah, I think it's, that's true. That, um, and the, I, I had a response to that, but it, it just slipped my mind. Um, if anyone else has something to say, please go ahead and uh, yeah. I'll remember what I was going to say in a moment. On, I think, page 56. Mm -hmm. Near the top, there was a there was uh, the second paragraph from the top. It says, "Quote: Freud's famous persecu persecutory paranoia is, in actual fact, a paranoia that seeks to persecute." Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that this sort of like uh, th this sort of interesting parallel, where he's sort of taking uh, what psychoanalysis says about homosexuality and sort of applying that back to the society which created psychoanalysis, um, and sort of like that the the whole aspect of homosexuality is a sort of um it it's almost like the shadow of this oedipal family that that sort of keeps reappearing every time you start to sort of investigate the the idea of the oedipal family and so i thought that this sort of bit was interesting because it's it's like it's almost like weird to say the psychological projection of this um paranoia about homosexuality being attributed to the homosexual themselves which isn't really true. Yeah, I think that's totally accurate. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, I suppose the one thing that sort of... Um, I don't know, the, uh, the, the question that I guess... And this is something that's kind of, I, I think, unaddressed in the text, but that reminded me of this zine I read about a year or two ago um, called... Terra Incognita, um, Terra as in T-E-R-R-O-R, and then Incognita as, you know, um, like your bra like how you uh, open your browser. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
it's um it's this uh zine put out by uh crime think where they sort of are trying to think about um anarchist organizing in a different way and um I, it's it's a very interesting zine because it, it doesn't make a lot of big references to um to critical theory at least not as far as i remember but it, it seems to be sort of uh implicitly like buying into like the deleuze and guattarian conception of desires this kind of polymorphic thing uh and there's the uh this really great anecdote from one of the authors in the uh in the first chapter about how they they licked their friend's boot and they were like uh they were like very like aroused by it but they were like i never really like wanted to lick a boot before it was never that like you know, late at night in my bed thinking about, man, I really want to look at food that'd be really fucking hot. But they um, ended up in this like position where like it was it was like a kind of flirty situation, you know, and uh, their mm -hmm. friend's boot was in their face and they were like, oh, I'm going to look this boot. That'll be hot. Uh, and it, I think that's sort of when we talk about um, the the individual, um, the d does the homosexual desire me? I think that the sort of uh, the counterpoint question there that I think the uh, persecutory uh, paranoia is kind of uh, also working against is the uh, do I desire the homosexual uh, or can I desire the homosexual? I think that's part of the... Oh, believe me, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's... Oh, go on. Oh, no, no, no. Pl no please I, respond. I... Well, I think that if you kind of in an interesting kind of dichotomy um, place like the homosexual on one end and not necessarily like the normal person or the heterosexual on the other end, but even like society, um, which is, I think what this is talking about is kind of that discussion between the homosexual and society on uh, the last paragraph um, before the strength of the anti-homosexual paranoia on 66, um, uh, Hoquiam writes, law is cl uh, clearly a system of desire in which provocation and voyeurism have their own place. The fantasy of the cop is not some creation of the homosexual's deranged mind, but the reality of a deviant desiring operation on the part of the police and judiciary. And that's, to me, really similar to what you said. Um, that like, there's, maybe it's not, so. it's like a... Um, like an almost like a return of the repressed, right? Like of society where they're, they say that they're afraid of the, the homosexual coming onto them, but maybe that's just because, you know, deep down they have this kind of fear, uh, fear, uh, fear, desire that he talks about later on. The fear that uh, you'll like Towards it. the homosexual himself. Right, well, yeah. yeah the that's fear that literally like what it, it is. Um, that, uh, what was it, it said about um, one of the cases it mentioned? And talked about how uh, it was like this paranoid seeing homosexuality where there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. They see because, homosexuality because of their own homosexuality. Yeah. In the, in in this chapter. Well, because yeah. in in the Schreiber case, it seems as if uh, I haven't actually read the whole thing. It seems as if Freud uses it as a general example of paranoia and not just a sort of analysis of homosexuality per se. I don't know if that's correct, but that's my impression. I really should have read the Schraber case. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I, I have not read the Schraber case. Um, I, gu I guess the, the thing that might be important to, to note here is that Freud, um, when, I was, when I was looking into the Schraber case a little bit earlier, though, Freud uh, never actually uh, interviewed or, or met Schraber himself. He, uh, only, mm -hmm. uh, his only knowledge of Schraber came from Schraber's memoirs and from uh, other case studies uh, or reading the work that uh, other psychologists had, uh, or psychoanalysts had done with Schraber. So, oh yeah, that's what I was saying about like how these same things get re-examined over and over, and we don't really know how much actual accurate meaning there is to find within this particular case, uh, especially after so many layers of different interpretation. Yeah, like if there's anything left that's meaningful to find. Yeah. yeah. I think I think it's sort of an issue when we get to the philosophy of science of like psychoanalysis where we're going to end up talking about how like scientifically useful uh, these sort of case studies are and especially if if even if they are how scientifically useful is analyzing someone's 
you know, auto- autobiography and literary writing um, and turning that into a sort of analysis of the human mind. Yeah, I, that's a, yeah. Important Not to question. suggest that, like, our other option is positivism because posit- positivism is also trash. So <laughs> right. it sort of becomes a question of, like, how do we talk about psychology without falling into this, like, debate about the philosophy of science? I think that's a great point. I, I think that Foucault has a lot to say about that as well, just scientism in general. He's extremely skeptical of yeah, Foucault's always kind of in the background of Hoquiam. He doesn't he doesn't cite him much, but he'll 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 throw like a, a short a short reference to Foucault in at the beginning of his books or the one that I'm translating yeah. right now starts off with a brief mention of Foucault's whole uh invention of the homosexual and I I, I think that um Hoquiam would agree with that uh that that uh thesis, the the creation of the homosexual as the identity as an identity based off of mm-hmm. What had previously been an act, but it's it seems that it's Foucault kind of runs through all of these pages, really. Like, I mean, yeah, I would agree. Tons of like, you know, not in name references, but just you know, between the between the between the lines, see a lot of like, oh, this yeah. sounds like something Foucault would say. Subtext, I think, right, is right. really there. The yeah, only sure. the only book of Foucault's I've read is Madness and Civilization, mm-hmm. and I do sort of detect that that subtext there um but i'm not exactly sure how to like sort of elucidate what i mean by by that so i'll just stop (laughs) no you're right i mean like he cites the um the longer version of madness and civilization right in the introduction so that's absolutely yeah i think all right moving uh moving forward through the through the uh this chapter two um Okay, so the first, like, section beyond the kind of introductory part is this unnatural act, nature and the law. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll, I mean, we can just kind of move through the whole thing in these subsections. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So unnatural acts and the law. Uh, A court of law. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, if anyone has any information about, he says very explicitly, he makes the point a few times, that the, this, the, the claim of being homosexual was not, as an unnatural act, was not present before the war. Um, it it I, was I, something, I, go ahead. I was going to say that, well, I don't think he makes he makes explicit that that's the case, but he doesn't. I don't know if he makes very explicit that the reason why, like, what was the advent of the war have to do with homosexuality being considered an unnatural act? I think, yeah, he he really doesn't talk about why, but I do think it is important that he notes that this is the case because, um, just from a historical interest in in the sort of period the post war period there was sort of a um revanche revanchism of like this sort of vision of like the nuclear family at least in american culture uh this is like the return of this uh dream of the housewife like and the uh perfect happy family where the father like goes to work and the children obey their father mm-hmm. and that before the be war there. you know there was a sort of in much larger inclusion of women to the workforce uh, yeah, well, in the factories. The war, yeah, I yeah. D- d- during the war, yeah. Sorry, um, excuse me. I don't know, like, necessarily how much it relates, um, but we see during the war there are certain pressures, I guess you could call it a deterritorialization, <laughs> where, uh, you know, women are drawn into what's traditionally not women's work to make up for them and being away, you know, just getting murderized in the big meat grinder um and then afterwards the you know the pressures are gone those pressures are gone it's got to uh like condense again which means it's got to recreate or re-territorialize in some way to place those uh like the men and women back into 
certain positions. Mm. And, and that also, means, yeah. It's also interesting because the code in which, I believe that the code in which they're talking about uh, where homosexuality was was like condemned as a um, unnatural act was only introduced by like the Vichy, the Vichy re- regime and that it was just maintained afterwards. Which is so typical. Which is which I think is interesting because we're talking about we we end up talking about like the Frankfurt School, which I haven't really read that much of, but I do know that um, one of at least what I've heard was one of Adorno's main kind of like critiques of society was the sort of like fascism fascization um, of society in which a lot of um, aspects of fascism were just um, reincorporated into post war society. Um, so I think this could be considered like a sort of classical classic example. And then, like, ultimately for Hawkwim, the important thing about the fact that this was instituted after the war is that it shows the way that, um, like, the progress myth, for one, is just a lie. Um, and then that the, uh, like, this social apparatus has to fall back on explanations of nature, which are really just secularized explanations of God to excuse itself when it can't find anything else. Yeah. This is, this is interesting because one of the things I, we sort of talked about in my philosophy of law class was the idea that like of natural law theory in general had its origins in like uh, theology and the, the belief that sort of like human law has to reflect, uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly, has to somehow like reflect uh, the law of God or, or just who, you know, is the creator of nature in that sort of viewpoint. Um, and so I think it's interesting to think about that, that um, the, the connection between the law and nature is, is nothing new and it has a history, but I, that's really all I can say. So how many, um, I, I'm going to assume, maybe I shouldn't assume, but I assume there are some Marxists here. I wouldn't consider myself a Marxist, but I definitely have read a lot of Marx, and I, I appreciate his ideas, so that's, okay. that's what I'll say. All so, I know uh, is that I'm not a Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, 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 I was, when I was reading this, I know we'll get into the concept of the family more thoroughly later on in the book, but I was wondering if anyone had any uh, like compare and contrast of Engel's work on the origin of the family here, because I was thinking about that as well. Um, moving when we were talking, when we were talking about uh, that's you know that's a book that I have not read and I want to read, but I do. I have sort of done a close analysis of uh, Marx's comments on the family in the 1844 manuscripts. So if we want to talk about that later on, I can try to. Pull that up. Okay, that sounds nice. Mm-hmm. Man, that thing that Hoquiam said about homosexuals just being so closely related to murderers was kind of shocking to me. At least because, you know, I was born in 93, and I luckily did not see that discourse, um, which is to say society has been liberalized since which, you know, you can argue is good or bad, but uh, I have not in my lifetime seen homosexuals being characterized as murderers. However, and, yeah. I think that's interesting because immediately what I thought of, and maybe this is a little bit of a buzzwordy term, but it's like the whole concept of um, queer coding of villains, and I say that with air mm-hmm. quotes, um, but I think that this is just a sort of continuation of a long-standing trend where there's association between like moral evil in general and homosexuality. And mm-hmm. if you want to talk about people talk about how certain you know Disney villains would reflect this, um, and that this this viewpoint of sort of like connecting because they cannot no longer they can no longer it's not publicly acceptable to make those characters like actually queer but they can sort of give them characteristics that people commonly associate with queer people. Right, um, and then, uh, well, if it's not like there's somebody who's, in, like, uh, writing something and going, well, we can't just call them gay, so we're just going to give them gay attributes. It's that those attributes are associated with the thing that contains both homosexuality and crime. Mm. And so is- nowadays, like, those things are split, but the characteristics attach to both of them anyway. And, and this is 
sort of a, a, a weird, but I, I was very interested to learn it. The, uh, the English word bad, uh, in fact, I think one of the etymologies for it is um, this uh, old old English word, uh, badal, which is where the uh, great journal Badan, which we'll probably be reading from eventually, uh, takes their Ooh. name. But uh, Badal basically meant uh, a, a hermaphrodite or a, a womanish oh, man. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, to say. it's very interesting. Um, but, uh, so, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, you can also say that the entire idea um, of sodomy is 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 just another example of this. That in I be, if I remember correctly, that in the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, there is no, at least as far as I remember, there is no mention of like actual homosexuality or, or homosexual acts. I, be, yeah, I believe as, that as this I, is as just I a recall, sort of, it's course, just sort of generally uh, portrayed as cities of sin, but there's no specific. They're, 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 the, in, they're at least in, There's no butt fucking. Yeah. <laughs> there's no butt fucking. <laughs> I think at least they do I, use the word I, perverse. Um, yeah. I, I remember. Um, oh, go ahead. I, Sorry. I'll stop. <laughs> no, 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 it's no problem. Uh, I, I took a class on um, uh, religion and love, which was the intersection of it. And uh, we spoke uh, about how uh, expressions of love and body love. Um, in ancient Greek society, like we were at the symposium and things, and uh, how that was extremely different and varied in Greek society. However, uh, you know, to for an older man to have a mentor role towards a younger man was the ideal expression of love, but to have a younger man be like they framed it as like the receiving end, or as to be to make love like a woman is that's like. But that that's that's a vice. That's uh, not at all an um, expression of love, but just perversion. And it kind of speaks to this contradiction of how there there can't be one without the other. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I think actually, uh, interestingly, um, to return to the text uh, at the end, at the very end of the um, unnatural acts and uh, nature and the law section, we get um, a quote from the uh, we get a quote from Saint Paul in uh, his Epistle mm -hmm. to the Romans referring to mm -hmm. men forsaking the natural use of women, which sure, um, yeah, I think I is, of that. is, again, again, this book doesn't even really uh, uh, mention uh, women very much. It's very focused on uh, uh, male homosexuality or uh, men. But I think that uh, to return to this, there's kind of this interesting, I, I, I don't know, the, uh, the, the misogyny in that statement really uh, stood out to me as... Um, it's it's not even just like a natural use of woman that would still be misogynistic, but it's it's the, <laughs> the natural use yeah, of woman, yeah, um, which intense. is is I guess uh, fucking um, and making kids. Um, <laughs> Jesus fucking yep. Christ. Um, but I I noticed that too. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll also get to that. Yeah. Um. So d just if I can kind of go back to the Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, example that if i remember correctly that the specific sin that sodom and gomorrah was destroyed for was um inhospitality inhospitality to strangers it was not um in general i do believe that they talked about like other kinds of like sins but that it was that specific one that they were destroyed for that um that was like that the straw that not, broke the camel's back in a sense yeah like pretty gay though yeah <laughs> you're right you're not wrong, <laughs> and and I think that it was it was after that it was who was it Lot uh, was like refused um, comfort in the city that they could not find like somebody to give them comfort that that's what they destroyed the city for. But uh, that's based on my sort of hazy long term memory of the story. I've never read the story in its original, but from what I've heard, that sounds pr correct. I think it's, it's very close. Yeah. That, that that seems to ring some bells to jog my memory a little bit. So I would be, I, I'm willing to believe that is what I'm saying. Um, Lot was the host, not the guest. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Um, okay. So we are, uh, okay. So it has been 25 minutes we've spent with chapter two and we are still, <laughs> we have uh, 10 more pages to get through. So, um, <laughs> 
I don't want to like cut anything short. Uh, but let us do we unless we have anything more to say about. Uh, I, I guess one of one of the the way that this section uh, ends, I think, and we can move on to the next is um that he's referring to some other author who I'm not familiar with. Um, uh, Gide, I suppose, is probably how you pronounce that. He's fact. a surrealist. Okay. Um, attempts to construct a homosexuality which is biologically based by means of comparison with other species. He is simply walking into the trap, which consists of a need to base the form of desire on nature. Um, I think... I think the trap is like the naturalistic fallacy. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm. And uh, Hawkeye even talks about in his other book, the what's it called, uh, the Screwball Asses. Uh, he talks about how profoundly unnatural humanity is in all of its form of existence, action, basic social practice, yada yada. So yeah, I guess it kind of overlaps in this regard. Um, um, yeah, that's that's interesting you say about this specific society because that in the 1844 manuscripts that is something that Marx sort of um, notes as characteristic of capitalist society, which is separation of what you know what he calls man from nature, which are sort of Hegelian terminologies which need to be described, but that's a sort of running theme through the through the book. And I think that's something to, that we should definitely keep in mind here. I think that is probably um, one of the one of the the bigger uh, the bigger points of this section, the uh, unnatural act section. Um, some of us are a part of nature, and some not. Um, right. To quote from the paragraph at the top of page sixty-two. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting to like. Think of the parallel of you know nature, things being natural and things being orderly, especially in the wake of the Second World War. Like when you look at things like the art that came out at the turn of the century and how disorderly it was with surrealism and data coming out to represent the kind of um, mental disarray that people experienced, and to see this like overwhelming need for order and things that are natural. I almost wonder mm -hmm. if that's a reflection of like a uh, kind of like a, a socio-political like desire for like just things to be, um, you know, like orderly. Not just a thought. I mean, <laughs> whatever. Good, but... good thought. Good thought. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm ready to move on if y'all are. All right, so this next section is a myth, the progress of public morals. And um, this is this is sort of a hoquiam kind of uh, yelling at, uh, I guess, uh, French, French liberals who are uh, telling the homosexuals um, to, to not worry uh, about their, their place in society. Um, he, quote, he quotes this refrain that... Uh, he hears from some French liberals, uh, it's unnatural, but no one's stopping you. Um, right. And then kind of goes into this this list of, I think it's three. Yeah, he sort of makes makes three points in regard to this uh, to this uh, objection that, first of all, there are, in fact, people stopping uh, stopping him. Uh, that there's a, uh, in France at this time, there's a great uh, sort of legal uh, Rep uh, a great sort of legal rep repression uh, centered on homosexuality. Um, there's different laws regarding um, age of consent with homosexuality. Homosexuality is sort of sectored off from the rest of sexuality within the legal system. Uh, and in addition to that, there's also um, a great deal of police raids, uh, apprehending homosexuals. Um, yeah, I think that's that's like the point that I would really emphasize about that is that even without the presence of any sort of like de jure um, discrimination and uh, oppression against homosexuals, it it absolutely does not mean that the justice justice system itself does not discriminate because this is like a, a fundamental point in discussing the like the modern or the sort of contemporary history of racism in America um, that 
that after the end of de jure segregation, there was still a significant amount of uh, like legal and like police repression of black people in America that had nothing to do with any sort of like law specifically targeting them for being black. It came down to how the the sort of like legal system itself was, um, for lack of a better term, structured to actually like assist in a sort of um, de facto repression of um, black people in America, and you can easily draw a parallel to that sort of repression uh, Hak- uh, Hakuyam is talking about in this section. Yeah. Um, it was something I was thinking of, too. And then we get in a... Uh, in, yeah, so th- and I think that's sort of the, the first objection that he's making to this uh, this refrain. The second one is um this just sort of... And th- this is a strange... Uh, this is a kind of a strange section because he's sort of talking about um, this I- idea that we still see uh, among some uh, some bad communists uh, that homosexuality is uh, an example of bourgeois decadence. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, approximately like five minutes ago, I saw a post someone shared on Facebook making fun of um, the Greek Communist Party, which still maintains a... Uh, party line opposed to uh homosexual marriage um because marriage should be destroyed well yes um their argument <laughs> however <laughs> is that uh their argument however is that uh the the nuclear family is the natural family uh as we just, <laughs> as we sort of refuted um which is which is about what mark said about on that so um but yes, and then so th- so that's that's the second objection that he raises to this. It's un uh, it's unnatural, but no one's stopping you. I'm not sure what that actually really has to do with uh, that statement. Um, but I-, I I suppose it is. Maybe he's imagining um, that uh, it maybe I, actually it probably was the case that in addition to liberals saying this to him, he probably also heard this from quite a few communists. Uh, because I, I guess mm, by that's fair. Po- point of just like a point of matter for uh, Hoquiam, uh, bi- biographically, that is uh, probably explains why he's sometimes uh, pretty uh, mad at the communists in France. He was uh, kicked out of the party for being gay. He was a member of the party when he was pretty young, and then was pretty quickly kicked out uh, for hate it when that happens. For being gay, yeah. <laughs> let me let me see if they. I think on his Wikipedia page they say what year he was kicked out, but. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say what age. Um, does not say what age he was kicked out. Um, and then the third, the third point that he makes is kind of returning to a uh, another point, which is the uh, that this is, I guess, a different refrain here from liberals, which is that this these are simply a few barbaric remnants in the penal code. We live in a much more tolerant society, even if this is still on the books. We have nothing to worry about because society is so tolerant nowadays. And as we've already discussed at great length, um, the particular phrasing of the um, law was revised uh, within Hoquiam's lifetime uh, while he was quite young, but uh, directly after the post-war period. He was born in 44, uh, towards the end of the war. So, um, yes. I think his third objection... um when he says, far from being more liberal, the French penal code has intensified its repression of homosexuality over the last 20 years. I think that speaks exactly to what Asadia was saying about it's similar to the way um, the state apparatus um, treats um, black people in America. I think that's like a very, very similar sort of yeah. parallel. We're using the word parallel a lot, but Although I, 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 I would, well, you can't, yeah. I, w- I would kind of push against that actually a little bit because I think that in, in this particular case, we're seeing the actual introduction of new codes. And actually, no, no, now that I think about it, we could, you could actually probably make that same argument with America. It would just be in race. But I think it would be that um, in the case of sort of America and race, the laws are not uh, explicitly coded um, mm. ag- against, black, against black people so much as they are sort of coded against. You can talk people about with, like uh, people with a drug with a drug conviction, which of course right, you right. know is incredibly mm-hmm. easy to. Uh, it's just that those people tend to overwhelmingly 
be black. Yeah, because right. you can. Police officers have an incredible amount of discretion in terms of arresting people for drug charges, and um, judges also have a gr- great great amount of discussion and discretion. And yeah, we sentencing. Know. Yeah, sentencing. We all we all know these arguments by now, I believe. Right, and and I think like it even goes down to the fact that the actual like uh, prohibition of of all sorts of drugs was actually directly linked in in a conscious plan to repress certain groups of people. Which like uh, if I can pull the quote, I will try eventually. But it, if it was a the Nixon aide who actually yeah, sort of we couldn't make it illegal to war on drugs. we couldn't make it illegal to be blacker against the war, so we cracked down on. Uh, weed and heroin or whatever right. which people associated with those groups yeah yeah I think for the rest of the section he mostly talks about kind of that last point right like the penal system yeah I like at least for a I, lot I love, of it. I love all of his references to Sartre um, because I, the, I'm the randomest books I've never heard of any of these Sartre books I've never heard of any of them either I've never I haven't read I've read like one Sartre thing and I, it was the, the he, he existentialism wrote thing books. and I wasn't a fan of Sartre's existentialism but that's beside the point but um there's the first reference to Sartre felt um Sartre is basically right here it felt very snarky um <laughs> yeah and I I, I appreciate it is um, my mic still working yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay, so there's like a whole like, list of types of tactic from uh, like things that laws and policies that explicitly target a group to things that implicitly will hit a group to ways methods of enforcement that aren't explicitly coded at all, but uh, are like enforced in a particular way to hit a particular group. And then a sort of action <laughs> through inaction uh, like, you know, just letting people die off in ways that, that will affect one group more proportionally. Um, yeah. So you can just go through the whole list of them. I think when he talks, there's a certain point he talks about um, syphilis later on in this chapter. Right. Where that was the part where I thought was like sort of like frighteningly prescient when it came to the AIDS crisis mm. um, and how there was the public response to that sort of made the problem worse um, and it almost became a sort of another way of repressing um, homosexuality uh, just by like letting people die and not helping yeah, them. That's I think yeah. is like the ultimate form like be and of the thing like the kind of antithesis of the repression through specific like explicit policies is to uh, through inaction mm. let a group of people be affected like in that case. Yeah, I would say that's true. Also, uh, one thing that I love doing is being a white person and going, wow, this is like racism, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's, yeah. see, that's what I'm trying not to do is to say that there are, like, that's why I say parallel and not like, this is the same thing because it's not the same thing. It has very, like, it has a very, very different history and, and you know, obviously much different mechanisms, but there sure. are, but the general principle is a parallel. And even if there are, and I think that it's, um, I'm, a, I'm a particular fan of uh, ex- explanation by contrast, too, I think is a very uh, mm. a good tool for understanding, uh, in my experience, um, that it, it's, uh, yeah, that, you know, it, it is different. But I think that there is, you know, we, we all can sort of, I'm assuming that we all come to this table with a particular understanding of the way that drug laws in the United States um have specifically targeted um, the black black uh, black people in the United States, and we can, I think, sort of uh, take take that as a as a sort of consent uh, consent as a as a place of consensus, and then sort of understand uh, Hoquiem's uh, point about uh, homosexual repression in France in the uh, later half of the twentieth century. I would also say that in the case of the United States, that a lot of the the laws that were sort of disproportionately targeting homosexual people were also at the same time disproportionately affecting black homosexual people, like even more so. Oh yeah, absolutely. Or they would, or you could even you know hit hit them with the same law. I mean, you know, you could. I'm sure uh, that I'm sure that you know gay bars are probably rated, uh, you know. 
more than your average bar. And I'm sure that black gay bars were rated even more than. Um, and I, I think like that one of the characteristics of Stonewall was that it was also like, it was very much frequented, not only like by gay people, but also like by a lot of um, non-white gay people. And that was also like a factor. Oh yeah. But uh, that's something I'm not super. <coughs> on. Yeah. I don't know the exact history with Stonewall. I, um, but I mean, well, the uh, um, I know that the um, the woman who's always associated with Stonewall, who I, I cannot remember, I believe Martha P. Johnson. Martha P. Yeah, Johnson. she she was she, Martha. Sorry, was was she black? I believe. Yes, she wasn't yes. white. I was going to say she's either black or um, Latinx, but I could not be uh, was not sure. Um, yeah, the law is clearly a system. Oh wait, we already we already read this. Yeah. The fantasy of the cop. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great, a great little great play. Paragraph. I, really I like love that. that paragraph. Yeah, I'll have to make a meme with that later. <laughs> yeah, you should. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this really it reminded me of some some entry in a thousand plateaus. Some, at some point, it kind of blurs together a lot. But <laughs> when, when they <laughs> when they discuss uh, sexuality being not necessarily a description of who you have sex with but more general kinds of libidinal desires like in the thousand places they talk about the capitalist counting as money in a sexual way oh, that know. was in anti-oedipus oh uh, was it in anti-oedipus no, yeah. like i'm saying it blurs i don't know but uh in one of the capitalism schizophrenia <laughs> books yeah, uh, it talks yeah. about how like everything and you know, like the bourgeoisie fucking the proletariat it's you know right, like sexuality is right literally in these things it's it's a sexual act and i think that like expanding that logic um to what um is saying in that paragraph about the the cop having voyeuristic sort of uh uh, sexual desires i think is really similar which is kind of why i was interested in the introduction about hearing about what hawkwayam defines as desire in general because i think that would be very interesting and it could almost like what you were saying earlier, Nat, about like it could almost seem if we ex- if he, if he expanded on it, it could almost seem like a metaphysical claim if he discussed homosexual. Uh, I mean, uh, desire in general. Yeah, and I'm I'm sort of assuming that um, he's keeping close with uh, Deleuze and Guattari in this sense because um, he was like uh, personal like friends with uh, Deleuze and Guattari. He uh, um, he like edited an edition of Guattari's journal uh, researches, or however they were probably it. all doing the proverbial too. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. They could have. Been. They could have. I I would be better. Like proverbial. Um, <laughs> be it's my new head cannon. That's a good head cannon. <sighs> I know that uh, Deleuze um, made an introduction for one of his later books that was in French. Yeah, I actually, I can't read because I, I can't read French. But. I have that book. Uh, I'm probably going to translate it eventually but i'm working if you translate it it, can i have it yeah absolutely oh my god i'm making very slow progress because my french is absolute shit but i'm working on uh, a different (laughs) book right now and then i i have a copy of the uh the one with the deleuze introduction is le Le de depon uh oh that's his other theoretical work yeah i have uh the homosexual drive and uh le premier de fond and i'm translating uh derived right now but uh i'm gonna get to le premier um or not it's not le premier it's just apreme um sorry but uh that's a small small tangent short tangent um that's fine should we move on to the strengthening of anti-homosexual paranoia um sure this is a pretty short section uh and we get um we get kind. Of, I feel like this is kind of him him restating his his thesis from a lot of this. That uh, no, it's it's not getting better. It's there's this sort of return of the repressed, like you said. It's kind of uh, yeah. Um, we get the sort of our public morals are in fact intricately connected with the law. The increase in convictions for homosexuality is related to an increase in homosexual practice. Um, which yeah reminds me of earlier he has that uh what was it that uh 
more more condemnations breathes the attitude. The more the ad, the more homosexuality is condemned, the more homosexuals there are. He has a little blurb in the first um, the block of text in sixty six where he says, we are not yet into fasc fascism, but Marcuse has rightly pointed to the increasingly totalitarian nature of ideology of modern capitalist society. Um, I think this is pertinent to his overall, but what seems to me, you know, not having read the full text, but what seems to me to be his overall, the overall upshot of the book, which seems like that society is producing the homosexual subject as a kind of villain or this antithesis to normality, which seems like, you know, he's, he's describing, um, he's almost describing like homosexuality as a line of flight away from this totalitarian, totalitarian uh, capitalist society as like a, a, a mode of uh, recourse towards the, um, the other, you know. He also uses the term, um, the crisis of the family um, mm. in relation to people opting out of child rear rearing, which I think could be an interesting point in that like he might see the like the reaction of society possibility as to sort of um condemn and repress homosexuality uh but that's sort of a speculative point. i guess that relates to like all the nihilist uh no future um don't have or like deny the existence of the future child stuff that i don't know enough about yet <laughs> No, yeah, um, yeah, although this would be sort of, uh, yeah, this would be a sort of different version of that, I, I suppose, because this is, I think that this is sort of, um, th this kind of interesting related thing, because he's talking specifically here, I think, about, um, young heterosexual couples who are opting not to have children, um, and the sort of crisis that, um, that's eliciting on the part of, uh, the larger society, which I, I suppose he is sort of making the claim that that sort of crisis uh, that that is being uh, improperly attributed to homosexuality rather than to, um, or like as a general as a general effect of it that it leads to repression of like all sorts of youth, and that it like especially would lead to repression of um, gay children within the family, which I think mm -hmm. is something that is like almost a universal experience, almost a universal experience for people who grew up um, in families that were like intolerant of homosexuality. So, yeah. Um, there's this weird reference to young people being murdered by bar owners. I'm, I have no idea what <laughs> oh, that is. Yeah. I have no idea what that is referring to. I suppose that was a, a, a spooky. Old people mm. are out to get us. <laughs> Oh, they yeah, are. I, I suppose that's just sort of, I, I don't know, this is something, maybe this was like a thing if I was a, around in French in the 1970s, I would be like, oh yeah, that thing, but right. I don't. Um, but also you have to acknowledge that theory stuff is just a lot of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, and what sticks means what seems true later on, and then the stuff mm. like this that just doesn't seem to resonate now, we just, we kind of ignore it and go, okay, that's a little weird, but whatever, not that important. Yeah, I think man, we, I think we should be happy. We've outlasted the murderers, bar owners. So there's yeah. that to victory. Yes, I'm proud of myself. I'm so, I'm I've gonna, never heard of them until now. I'm gonna well, I think this is by going to the bar and not being murdered tonight. <laughs> That's yeah. an interesting thing because, like, people in America, like, because it seems like they're talking about like teenagers getting murdered. Um, but and teenagers in America aren't even allowed inside of bars. So, like. It's, it would be weird to us as well in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. Um, it almost kind of reminds me of the Foucauldian Fuc Fuc like power dynamic again. Of like what 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 constitutes you know the power, like brutal power, like being murdered, or like less more like more subtle power, like someone inside an establishment. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm doing theory. I'm just throwing things at a wall. <laughs> um. I think we can probably move past this section because, as we said, there's not a ton of a ton of new things happening here. Uh, onto the, I think we we talked about this a, a bit earlier. Uh, homosexuality and crime. Yeah, we've been talking about this whole the, the homosexuals. It's yeah, you just love to be homosexual and then go out and do a murder. Um, <laughs> classic gay Friday night. Um, classic. Gay Friday night. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I love the, I think that this, this first sentence is probably one of my favorite sentences in the book. Uh, homosexuality, homosexuality is first of all, a criminal category. Mm. Um, uh, I'm gonna highlight that. Yeah, and I think you know, especially if we think about, um, you know, the, uh, if we go back to the sort of the creation of homosexuality and the homosexual and um, the sort of uh, idea of, you know, I mean, the idea of the homosexual as an identity begins in uh, what, psychiatry, psychoanalysis. But um, I, I think you know, is it is it surprising that uh, prisons resemble hospitals, factories, schools? Oh my or, fucking god! Um, <laughs> oh my god! I know that, that meme is a little stale, but uh, sorry. But yeah, you know, we um, yeah. I, I don't know. I... I've never read any Genet. I haven't either. So I, his like many references to Genet, I think a little lost on um, me, unfortunately. I actually kind of wanted to comment on the next sentence right after the um, the one you mentioned, which is certainly, as we shall see later, psychiatry tends to replace legal repression with the internalization of guilt. Mm. And 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 I and I think that this is a sort of like um, allusion to the idea that uh, that even with with even if you are not like sort of uh, in, in a sense incarcerated within a psychiatric hospital. Um, or you're not, nobody's forcing you to go to therapy in order, that even if that's not the case, that um, there are lots of like ways in which um, sort of psychological characteristics of people are sort of policed um, within society more generally, which is like, with it, like by like schools, um, sort of like forcing kids to go to the school counselor, with it, if it's parents forcing their children to go to therapy. Um, and so like, and and sort of that in sort of the sense the sense is like or the quote internalization of guilt. I do think that that's that happens, but also has to be accompanied by like an actual repressive mechanism, um, which sort of uh, causes this internalization. Um, so that's you know. Yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, no, I I would definitely agree. I don't think if you like think about you know like. The, you use Foucault again, you know, the Panopticon. Um, Panopticon doesn't just appear. It, it does have a, it does begin with a very sort of real and physical manifestation in some form. And then it does become, an, uh, you know, sort of internalized thing that it's famous for, but that uh, it's still, still there. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 and, the, and the physicality like, of it is still important should not be right, discounted. If we don't, if we're not taking, like, our, as our standpoint, like, a sort of just um, abstract, like, individual, and we're going to talk about, like, people in real, like, social relations, like, if you want to talk about the um, the kid who is forced by their parents to go to therapy, well, we're, we're talking about somebody who, like, physically is dependent on their family, or if there is no family, it would be, like, a foster home, or the state is their guardian. And so... In this situation, it's not just um, a sort of um, a mechanism within the personality or a mechanism within the mind. It is it's it's a mechanism caused by like actual necessity, um, which I think is a, is an important point that I would sort of raise. Which I I guess I, what I'm saying is I'm not sure I like the implication of the idea of um, the internalization of guilt, but we can get into that later. I'm wondering if a uh... Hukwiam talks about guilt and shame later because he mentions it a few times in the first few chapters. Is that so, Matt? Um, I'm trying to remember. I want to say I don't think he does in this. That's story. interesting. He might. It seems like a very important point. Might a little bit in the in the in the in the next chapter, capitalism, the family, and the anus, which is my favorite mm -hmm. chapter title of anything ever. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, or actually, maybe even in chapter five, the object to choice and. Uh, the object choice and uh, behavior, but I cannot remember for sure. Um, so we'll see. We will see. Um, I yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, but yeah. Although I'll, I'll also add that the idea of internalization suggests like an external kind of 
thing causing the external the internalization. So I don't think it's necessarily like the, the, the excludes any kind of conception of shame and guilt as a social mechanism. What, say more about that. Um, so the the sort of like the notion is like it's not just that like shame and guilt just sort of is like the uh, spontaneous reaction like understanding or sort of uh, observing themselves like transgressing a law or moral boundary but I think it also requires like in general that there would be some kind of consequence for that transgression for this to first happen and so what I'm saying I guess is that I don't think um, Hakuyam is like um, excluding that I just don't I think it's more in the subtext of what he said there okay I see because because I do think that there's um are you saying that there isn't or ne- isn't necessarily an external force? No, I'm saying, there is, I'm saying there is ne- necessarily oh, okay. some sort of like external okay, yeah, repression. Yeah. Okay, all right, misunderstood. Then I agree with you in that case. Do you want to go to homosexuality and disease? Um, yeah, we yeah, should go to homosexuality and disease. Um, We get the we we referenced sort of earlier the um, the bit about syphilis where he talks about um and I, again this is incredibly sort of you could probably write this paragraph and replace syphilis with HIV uh, AIDS mm. and it would be and yeah if we think about some of the you know what was it uh William F Buckley said that uh, HIV positive men should have uh, a warning tattooed on their ass. Um, I hate him uh, so much. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a very sort of um, it's a very sort of it's a very sort of prescient thing. He has uh, syphilis is not just a virus but an ideology too. It forms a mm-hmm. fantasy whole, like the plague and its symptoms as Antoine Artaud analyzed them. The basis of syphilis is the fantasy fear of contamination of a secret parallel advance both by the virus and by the libido's unconscious forces. The homosexual transmits syphilis as he transmits homosexuality. The same What a sentence. Yeah, and then I like it. <laughs> I I love that sentence. I like this uh this parenthetical that follows it. The same thing happens in fascist ideology. The healthy confront the degenerate in a battle in which the fate of our civilization hangs. And Yeah, it's this it's it's good. I the the homosexual transmits syphilis as he transmits homosexuality. That reminds me of the, the boot story that I uh, shared from that right, scene right, earlier. Right. The um, yeah, it's similar to just like the fear uh, desire dichotomy of like I'm afraid I'll catch the gay right if I like yeah, kiss like it's really, someone else's um, gay. Just this concept of syphilis not being a virus but being this kind of I don't know what you call it, this combination of two completely um, opposite in nature, or not opposite, but completely different in nature things, the virus and the ideology surrounding it is like, I don't have conclusions on it exactly, but it's kind of a big idea to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, so yeah, I, I mentioned earlier uh, the sort of like connection between this section and the later um, AIDS crisis, which if if this was um, written in, I think nineteen seventy eight, it's sort of scary how like it was published in be... English in seventy eight. I think it was written in French. It was published in French in seventy two. Got you. Okay, so I think that 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 like in and of itself makes it even more sort of like eerie. And also tragically, and um, hopefully, um, uh, when he did pass away, he passed away from uh, uh, complications related to AIDS. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, c- sorry. Continue. Um, no, no. Um, I was sort of trying to collect my thoughts on this, and and so I think like the the quote about syphilis being an ideology. If we want to, if we want to say now, okay, HIV is like in the consciousness of the like heterosexual public is is a sort of ideology, and that like there is this sort of immediate like stigma attached to the disease and that's related to AIDS. 
um, and like that, or sorry, that's related to uh, homosexuality in the minds of the people who think about it. Uh, and it reminds me of this sort of um, the story I read of a um, a high schooler who was who contracted HIV through a blood transfusion, but that they were con- they were basically like bullied in their school and called like all sorts of um, anti homosexual slurs. Um, be- because they had AIDS, they weren't gay. Um, they did not self-identify as gay or in any in any way. Like they were immediately just connected with homosexuality because they had contracted AIDS. Right, it's like something that's that. Or HIV. Is, sorry, excuse me. It's like something that's more pervasive than just the the virus itself. Like he's saying, like it, it almost doesn't seem. I'm like having trouble understanding exactly what he means by saying it's an ideology because i think there's something to say about it being more than just a um a disease and a virus because you know it it, it signifies certain things mm-hmm. but uh and you know like there's this metonymy of homosexuality that kind of well at least with hiv aids um definitely there's this metonymy of homosexuality that per that is linked to hiv aids but um, as an ideology, I guess I'm kind of missing the mark on exactly what he means by ide- uh, it being an ideology. That just seems like maybe I, yeah. I'm just understanding what he means by ideology. But I think I think that's I, I'm not sure I like the use of the term ideology. Um, I'm I'm sort of of analysis of ideology in general, but that's like my personal like kind of view. But I do think if you want to say it's like a signifier, sure. like that might be a more accurate way of describing it. But that like no matter what he means, I think that the general point is true, which is that HIV AIDS is means more than, than just the, like the virus itself and the, and the complications of it. It means it's, it's association with homosexuality sort of, um, trend trans, like transfigures it into something else. I would completely agree in that case. If you were to replace ideology with signifier, then I would say that's absolutely apt. Mm-hmm. yeah no yeah no i i do sort of i, I am i don't know because yeah the syphilis as an ideology bit is i i think i can see where he's going but i'm not sure how to express it and that makes me question my understanding of it so yeah well if if you follow an act like there an ideology is like an unconscious like sort of set of rules that people follow perhaps yeah and, so it might be more uh, correct to say that syphilis has ideological or that syphilis is ideologically determined or that, is that well and and then and we can talk about like that the either, preceding though. words um in that sentence where he says um syphilis is not just a virus but an ideology too he he says um i think I'll just start at the beginning of, of that paragraph, which, quote, We already know about the function of the fear of syphilis in middle-class sexuality as a whole, and to what extent the fear of venereal disease acts as a barrier to sexual normality. The weakening of the free social cover against venereal disease, which, it was, a, which was more readily available in the past than today, is known to the whole medical establishment. The shame that accompanies the disease, the repressive system by which the social worker has virtual police rights in the case of syphilis, uh, parentheses, including actual, including access to the files and his ability to force the patient to declare all sexual contacts who could have been affected are sufficient to explain the spread of the disease. So, um, if we want to talk about like ideology as a system, he, it seems to say like that it's not just a system within the sort of like the viewpoints of those who hold the ideology. It it, it extends also to the sort of um, the the way in which society deals with syphilis in a, in a real sense. Uh, so we're talking about how people think it's legitimate that the social worker can force like uh, the patient to disclose their entire sexual history. Um, that this is something that where the view about the disease and its like its relation to sex uh, it extends past like what the disease really is. Um, and I, and I think that's a, an interesting point. And I think that therefore when he also says like 
uh, venereal disease as a barrier to sexual normality, right? Where the association between venereal disease and homosexuality becomes um, obvious in that sense because it seems as if uh, Huckleyam is saying that uh, homosexuality is, by its very nature, past the barrier of sexual normality because it is defined in distinction to sexual normality, which is heterosexuality. Mm-hmm. You can see that. I, I'm not crazy about his wording of it, but that could also be a translation error as well. You know, yeah, that's, French. that's true. Yeah. And that was a very good um, explication that you gave, Basidio. Oh, thank you. Flips hair. No, that was great. Um, <laughs> the the next paragraph, I think, is sort of um, again. This is sort of returning to um, to attempt to make homosexuality respectable by means of psychology is hopeless. When DJ West advocates prevention through tolerance, he is crusading for the impossible. For it is difficult to see any point in tolerating something you've already decided to prevent. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, any investigation of the causes in this respect is merely an a posteriori justification of social repression. It is in it is clear in the case of Havelock Ellis, who concludes his otherwise comprehensive work on homosexuality, in a statement that the assertion of homosexuality cannot be tolerated, even if we must tolerate its existence. Um, Hans Hans writes: Deficiency oc- occurs within order. Perversion is against the order. For geese, the efficiency is the loss of reproductive sexuality. The perversion is the assertion of homosexuality. Um, and that's something that's kind Just of interesting. Quick, Sorry, what do you say? Quick comment. I think if it's German, it should be Giza, but um, oh, that's well, probably minor. I took German in high school. I should know better. Um, <laughs> Same. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right. Um, and I think that's... Uh, that's interesting, I think. That reminds me of the 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 Saint Paul quote that we got a couple pages back about the the natural use of women, um men forsaking the natural use of women. Uh we I I think it's it's interesting to see the sort of the parallels there that uh d- deficiency as the loss of reproductive sexuality and perversion as the assertion of homosexuality. And so I think that what um it might be kind of interesting to think about um, the yeah it, it it's interesting to think about those those two sort of I guess we could say the, the two aspects of um, of homosexuality it's deficient and it's perversion uh, and sort of I think he's the, gonna he's gonna play on that a little bit more when he did, when he talks about the Oedipus complex I think so yeah. um yeah, and we're almost done with this chapter, and we've spent more than an hour on it at this point. So let's keep on pushing. Um, mm-hmm. The next, ch- the next paragraph, he gets mad at the French Communist Party again. Um, <laughs> he calls them the bourgeois super ego. I love <laughs> that. Which is so good. Um, I always love a little bit of dunking on the BCF. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, there's. We must not. I'm not French. Is just I don't know. Um, there's always a little bit of it in any sort of piece of French ultra left literature. Yeah, you're going to encounter at least some sort of bird. <laughs> From what I understand, the uh, PCF has not done themselves many favors um, over the years. I love this quote from a, a member of the Central Committee: "The but you must not confuse drugs, sexual perversion, or theft with revolutionary action." Um, oh my god! <laughs> like yeah, I've hey, seen you, communists but... like say things like that, oh, like nowadays. Yeah, I see that every day. It. Yeah, I see it's that terrible. all the time. <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. It, it's, it's like every um, it, all those like nozzles on Twitter will say oh something almost indistinguishable from that, like every single day that you'll yeah. find that quote, and then someone will quote tweet it and be like, "Fuck!" Like every time. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, oh are they any better than the BCF? N- Nosbols? No, no, they aren't. <laughs> no, no, they're not. I mean, they're not, like, worse. I, well, they, like, they the never PCF had any not... political par- power compared to the the PCF, so that's yeah. uh, the point of the Nosbols' favor, unfortunately. <laughs> um, that they've never you had political that? power. 
I'm actually not so sure, like, at this point. But we can get I into mean, that. Dogen yeah, yeah. is quite that popular. Have to do with I, yeah. I, I realized that, that was a very sort of Western-centric uh, thing to say, because, yeah, then I immediately was like, oh, wait, no, there is literally a Nazbol party in Russia, and... Uh, Even Richard Spencer, yeah, I believe his he's married to somebody who's a Nazbol. Like, oh, seems really? to really, yeah. really like echo their um, viewpoints. Yeah, no, Richard <laughs> Spencer's wife uh, is Dugan's English translator. Um, we must not let them reproduce. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. um. Yeah, here. Um, it is not homosexual behavior as such at which the moralizing paranoia is directed. This is at the, the last paragraph on page 71. The fact that one man makes love with another is never the point of this kind of statement. Homosexuality seems rather to represent the detritus of a well-oiled social machine whose workings the Communist Party would like to improve on still further. It is what remains of an unclassifiable and unserviceable libido, non-sexual as opposed to the strictly defined sexuality. Its desiring forms it has, in its desiring forms, it has no place in the social structure. Society burns its refuse. Me medieval society used to burn its homosexuals at the stake. Modern society has more rational methods of elimination. The moral <laughs> pollution um, seems to have the same kind of staying power as industrial pollution. The machine produces a constantly flowing, a constantly rising flow of detritus, which is increasingly capable of bringing un under control. Um, and then he quotes. Uh, some other dude saying that. Uh, Sorry. Um, <laughs> that uh, it would be that uh, okay. <laughs> that uh, doctors want to uh, basically put homosexuals in uh, work clap in uh, work camps. Uh, yeah. That's some good shit. Yeah. Um. I think I think honestly, like this sort of um, the the quote about uh, uh, let me detritus uh, of a well-oiled social machine whose workings the Communist Party would like to improve on still further. I think I think this is sort of an interesting as like a um, just like an, even though it was an offhand, I really think like speak to something true about how um, parties such as like the the PCS, if I recall correctly, are. Um, Marxist Leninist parties, um, and, and and other sorts of like uh, parties in the in the vein of like the, the aftermath of from, like, uh, from Greece, right? Um, and and being, go ahead. Oh no, I, I mean I was just thinking that the KKD other examples, Greece, yeah, 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 right, right. Another um, the it, the Italian uh, PCI, I want to say. Um, so like all of these uh, European sort of uh, classic communist parties um, that. Their attitude towards capitalism, or I, for lack of a better word, capitalism, because that's how they define it, um, it, it, it does seem to be as a sort of like, oh, the, the capitalist class does not run it correctly, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that, like, the, the, they see it as a sort of like, um, it's a, there is a fetishization of capital as just machines, productive forces, et cetera, um, that, does, that refuses to see it as, like, a social relation that actually is functional um, for its specific purpose and instead sees it as, like, sees capitalism as a sort of imperfection of capital. Um, as an and, imperfection and, of nature. And, it, yeah, it, an, imperfect, an imperfection of the sort of um, the labor process, which they see as, even though they won't say it in these terms, which they see as capitalistic by nature. Yeah, there's the, there's sort of this still, you know, I th I my one of my favorite things to do with uh, the, the more traditional c communists is uh, try to start questioning production around them and uh, watch them lose their shit uh, at the idea that no one <laughs> would dare criticize production. <laughs> um, um, I think it's it is interesting to me because I I rarely I it's not actually I'm not going to say this as like as an absolute thing. There are many many um, Marxist Leninists who do. Um, sort of get more into the into the guts of uh, capitalist production, but that the sort of official party line on on it, um, it, it it seems to be uh, it seems to sort of lack comprehension of capital as a social relation, um, and it seems to think they seem to basically unironically adopt the line uh, that 
instead of as Engel said that they cannot lay hand like they hold to the ready ma- main machinery of the state um, that they do think you can um, but that it can be the, the machinery of the state uh, can be used to like for communistic purposes but I think it's also important to note that the the machinery of the state so to speak is also like at, at its in the end is capital that capital is the sort of underlying um, assumption of the state in a sense and so trying to take control of the state sort of in the end is going to presuppose capital and to be fair i think even a lot of them view that as a sort of temporary measure or as a right. um i mean you do have some who unironically do see it as the end all be all that's as good as you're going to get is you're going to manage capital through the state in a uh, way that you'll call socialistic, uh, but um, which, depending on however the fuck... <laughs> the greater it, good, the, the people. Yeah, you'll, you'll and, manage and, it for the benefit of the people or something like that, rather than and it, it, yeah um, dismantling it. And, and I think that, that it's sort of uh, it, the general <laughs> kind of... Um, view is this metaphysical view of the state as being a, um, as like in general as being a neutral object um, that can be the ca- that can have either a bourgeois or proletarian characteristic which I think is the fundamental mistake there, um, which is that the state itself, um, at least in its current form uh, cannot be proletarian um, at all and it must be like bourgeois um, and that's the sort of like, that's the sort of perspective that with which I view it um, and I think that so that's even saying that you can use the state, um, use control because the state in the situation is going to be in control of capital to use capital, uh, for socialistic purposes. To me, that is a sort of contradiction in terms. Yeah. Um, and so th- hence the whole well oiled, um, social machine comment to me really does ring true. Yes. Um, also, uh, just like a, a point of history, the PCF at this time was uh, a uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, Marxist-Leninist group, um, or Marxist. It, it, it held a Marxist-Leninist line, and um, tellingly, now uh, on Wikipedia, its uh, ideology is listed as communism and uh, soft Euroscepticism. Um, hmm. <laughs> Um, hmm. and, and I think it's, it is also probably interesting to keep in mind that um, Hoquiam was uh, a participant in 68 which uh, on the student on the I don't know if he was a student at the time um, actually no he would have been around 22 years old so he probably would have been around a student I mean, this book came out when he was like 25 holy cow he was smart hmm. uh, he was a <laughs> precocious precocious young man um, but uh, the the uh, well, the French Communist Party did support the worker strikes. Um, they did uh, condemn and, uh, in a few cases, I believe, actually actively sabotage the student movements that were concurrent with those uh, strikes. So, yeah, I think we should probably move on from this because we could talk about the problems with Marxism, Leninism, for hours. ad nauseum. Um, yeah. There is one more section left in this chapter, and then... We will trudge on to Disgusting Perverts, Chapter 3. Um, yes. Uh, yes. So this last section, um, yeah. I don't know. Does anyone have anything they want to start off by saying about it? I guess I'll, if no one does, I'm assuming that's what that silence means. It is no longer sufficient to analyze society. This is at the, in the middle of the first paragraph. It is no longer sufficient to analyze society in terms of a conflict between conscious groups united by their interests, the classes. We must also recognize the existence, besides conscious political investments, of unconscious libidinal investments, which sometimes conflict with the former, as in the case of communist activists. And th- when did libidinal economy come out? Do we know? Libidinal 1974. Economy. 74. So this is actually before libidinal economy. Um, but I 
believe I having not actually read libidinal economy proper, but read works that reference it and just sort of generally knowing uh the the sort of gist of it. Uh and this sounds very much in line with uh Leotard's uh thesis regarding um yeah, libidinal investments and uh in the libido in general and desire. And I, th I think this is generally where I get a lot of sort of um, those kind of the, the political thrust behind this book of, um, you know, Hoquiam's, I guess, what Hoquiam actually means by desire and um, as this kind of undifferentiated, um, productive, but also sort of uh, sort of reactive force. Um, I think I've spoken way too much so far, so I guess the only thing I'll state is that, um, the bit about the, oh, you cut out. whether or not, the... hello, hello, yeah, sorry, you, you just cut out for a second, sorry, excuse me, uh, that was probably my internet, uh, so the, the bit about, uh, like, lib the little bit, the unconscious libidinal investments, which conflict with the former, as in the case of communist activi activists, right? But my only comment about that is that I, I'm actually not so sure that in terms of communist activists per se, that necessarily what they're doing is con conflicting with their, um, their conscious sort of um, political investments. Because I do think that there is to a level with which certain communist parties really more um, represent the interests of certain segments of the bourgeoisie um, in in a sort of like alliance with the proletariat in in a way that really sort of is meant to um, advance the interests of a certain segment of that class. However, um, I'm not really super familiar with the 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 term unconscious lib libidinal investments, so I'm gonna bow out there. Yeah, I think I mean this is I think like first and foremost uh, uh, a dig at the Communist Party again. And so it, it is kind of hard a little bit to to tease out the because I, I think that there might be some ways in which um, Hoquiam is kind of I don't want to say like clinging to traditional communism too much but I, I guess kind of clinging to some uh, notion that uh, no like this is sort of uh, what like uh, this is like what communism should be rather than saying that Maybe there are some, and, and I don't, this isn't a claim that I'm, like, prepared to, like, die on the hill of, but this is something that I think mm -hmm. is probably something that we should discuss, and maybe it's wrong, and maybe Hoquiam is, is right to do this, but I think that maybe it, it might be worth reevaluating the position of, you know, is, so, like, we you know, one, like, what do we mean by communism and socialism, and um, then how do we interpret that, like, what is, uh, and then also, yeah, sort of how does that um, relate to the uh the words just went out of my head this happens this is gonna happen a lot uh throughout this reading group well I'll, I'll start saying something and then just kind of trail off my my brain doesn't work too good sometimes um that's yeah that's totally understandable um that's a feature we should be happy <laughs> this is more of a free-flowing discussion than it is like a uh some sort of like statement like you know yeah i didn't yeah. think we should really just stick to the text and strictly discuss what is being said by the author yada yada but I, it's I, much I, more I, fun actually just floating from one topic to another organically more or less like called rhizomes <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess i guess the sort of i, I think just i'm to, not hungry i think that to to circle back to um Asadia's point and uh just kind of close it close out this chapter and um we'll, we'll talk after this but i think maybe close out the recording for the day and the discussion for the day um that yeah maybe it, it it is the case um like you said that you know i think communism and socialism are both unfortunately kind of vague terms and uh as a result it's uh it, it is maybe the case that uh no they're the conscious political investments of certain communist activists are not in conflict with their unconscious libidinal investments uh, and that both of their sort of uh, conscious and unconscious political investments and libidinal investments are 
maybe aligned counter to uh, the uh, political and libidinal investments of uh, Hoquiam or and uh, those who would uh, who would follow him. I think I think uh, <clears throat> If that, point, does that make sense? I think. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, uh, like I, I think the point I was mostly <laughs> trying to to get at, because I think you're right that communism and socialism. I, I don't know if they're, they're vague and of themselves so much as that they're used vaguely. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I personally have very specific definitions for both of them, but when I talk to people, I always ask them, "What is your definition?" Because right. I expect that we're going to disagree. Um. Yeah, and 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 I think, like for instance, I read um, a sort of um, uh, one of Pentecost's texts on trade unions, um, in which he he sort of uh, analyzes the class position of trade union, <coughs> union rep- representatives and and shows that you know th- that despite claiming that despite the fact that unions in general will claim to represent uh, the workers um, of like the certain field in which they are they're like in. So if you're talking about like you know a textile union. The, the union claims to represent the textile workers and that there's a certain uh, sense to which that everyone sees that since the union representatives sort of um, come from the class of proletarians that they must sort of represent that class. However, in Panikoic's argument, he says that as union representatives, they no longer really are simply proletarian and so that they have a different relation um, and a different class position that people than people normally assume. And so that what people claim about themselves and even even sort of like how um communist parties sort of like i was gonna say this in, reminds in, me a lot of the way that um a lot of communist parties will say a you know a particular uh parliamentary is a proletarian parliamentary because the uh, yeah the members the you know the elected officials were at one point you know a carpenter or a mechanic mm-hmm. or something and it's like well they're not actively engaged in that work anymore and now they're engaged in this administrative work and that administrative work means that they have an ability to make decisions that uh, other people are beholden to and which are not uh, and those decisions are not being made by the people who are enacting that uh, right enacting. And, and I think and I think that when we get to talking about like communist parties that communist parties are um, a great example of this where that the Leninist sort of standard claim, and I think it's like represented like most in its most sort of pure form to me by uh, actually Bordiga's theory of the party, um, which is that the theory of the party is that the party itself is a sort of um, uh, a rep- that it is the sort of most class conscious, most advanced sections of the proletarian class itself, right? And that it's a total identification with. Um, between the party as an institution and the the sector of the working class that is revolutionary in in this sort of sense, um, it's a total identification of those two things. Uh, and and I think that the problem is is that this just sort of denies the reality that in most communist parties and all of history and most socialist parties and all of history that it was actually uh, people who were by definition uh, petite bourgeois who actually held party who actually held power within the parties as institutions. There are obviously exceptions to this, but I think that if we're going to, like, I, I am not sure about the, the PCF in particular, but that if we want to look at the PCF as, as it was constituted at the time, that um, that this was probably also the case with them. Yeah, and I think there's, yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, I think it's, and yeah, I think this actually reminds me of something that you see from some of the uh, a, a Maoist uh, point sometimes, where they... Um, I've seen Maoists make the claim, and I don't know um, if this is actually within Mao's writing or if this is one of those weird things where Maoists in the Western world um, sort of become weirdo, pseudo-anarchists. But they, uh, you know, I saw a Maoist once make the claim that under, you know, under capitalism, the primary contradiction is between the proletariat and the bourgeois. Uh, under socialism, the primary uh, contradiction is between the proletariat and the party. Uh, which seems like a really strange claim to make uh, if your if your argument is that you're advancing as this person was was that we need to create a party um, rather than just trying to right. resolve contradictions. <laughs> but um, 
it seems it but seems it, as if the it, goal it is, is, it is but it is a similar it is a similar argument albeit theirs is being made toward a different end but i think it's yeah uh yeah and and, and so that the reason this is a, honestly a minor point i think laboring it a bit too much but that i think that the the um the point of such sentences is that like they represent a sort of dissatisfaction with uh communist po- politics as a whole uh, because of the fact that these communist parties have become so dominant and have retained such a oppressive, like, and repressive control over the the class which they claim to represent, in a sense, um, and that that class is a, like actual expression of like political activity, that people just become dissatisfied with communist politics as a whole, uh, and then identify groups like you know communist parties such as the CF with communism, like in general, which to me is understandable but also like problematic. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I do want to, I want to, I want to get into this last paragraph of this chapter because I think it's really uh, a great, like, Deleuzian and Guattarian uh, paragraph. Um, but before we do that, I want to, um, because we've lost um, Jamie and Yvette at this point, um, and also this recording is currently at two hours fifteen minutes. Um, would you want to cut it at um, th- this discussion? at uh the first two chapters and then either at some point during this week or next weekend we can do uh chapter three and possibly chapter four um i suppose if we did chapter three during the um during this uh upcoming week we'd probably do chapter four uh on the weekend but if we waited till till next weekend we could probably do both um, um maybe not because chapter four is one of my favorite chapters although it's not very long hmm. i oh, think wait, no. um I well i think since this is sort of our like practice run and like we're now like doing this for the first time that that's also kind of contributed to the fact that like, we've gone pretty long-winded mm-hmm. and like also the fact that i i didn't really come prepared with notes which led to i think for me like to kind of like uh talk at length trying to actually like figure out what i'm saying before i even say it um that kind of led to me like meandering and i talk a lot and i didn't take notes either (laughs) no you're fine um okay so in that case um yeah we'll we'll cut it after we discuss this last paragraph but um i want to discuss this last paragraph because we get a lot of like Deleuze and Guattarian buzzwords in here, but I I, I like this one. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, it is not necessary. This is from the last paragraph on page 72, uh, the last paragraph of chapter two. Um, it is not necessary to go through the Oedipal identifications in order to recognize the presence of desire in the social machine not at a symbolic level where only the family archetypes would come into play, but at a direct level. This brings us back to the distinction between the molecular level of desire and the molar level of the great social machine. We can say, generally speaking, that the sublimation of homosexuality as the basis for the functioning of the great social machines corresponds to the oppression of the molecular by the molar. The latent homosexuality so beloved of psychoanalysis corresponds to the oppression of patent homosexuality. And we find the greatest charge of latent homosexuality in the social machines, which are particularly anti-homosexual, the army, the school, the church, sport, etc. At the collective level, this sublimation is a means of transforming desire, is transforming desire into the desire to repress. Um, and I, I really, I there's, there's a lot going on in this paragraph. I think this is probably one of the most like jam-packed paragraphs in the book, um, mm. because we get sort of the. We get we get a lot of the things I was talking about earlier. Where we have the sort of um, we have the sort of what I call the moon sand of desire, um, <laughs> being uh, transformed by uh, by being transformed at the what he calls the molar level of the great social machine into this desire to oppress homosexuality. Um, in that way that homosexuality becomes that in that sort of the homosexual eroticism becomes the basis of all of our non-sexual interactions, all of our non-erotic interactions. Um, And um, it also reminds me of a a story that I'll I'll probably tell again when we get to chapter four, because that was the chapter 
I read um, with the reading group that I first encountered this text with, but um, one of the men who uh, was there was uh, an older, uh, an older gentleman, gentleman, I probably a retiree um, who I'm assuming is straight because I've met his wife. Um, but uh, who knows? Um, at the very least, not exclusively. Yeah. Um, at least not exclusively homosexual. homosexual. But he was uh, speaking about his time in the army, and we'll we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, buckles, anuses, in uh, chapter four. But he was mm-hmm. talking about uh, one of the things that was uh, incredibly sort of shocking to him when he joined the army was having to shit in front of other people. Um, I don't know why this was a a thing that happened to him in the army specifically, I imagine, I guess that it was something that, I don't know, you're in the field or whatever, I don't know. I, I want to say that it has, that they don't, like, put stalls because they want the people to, like, get used to the whole, like, um, aspect of trying to do these things in the field where there are no stalls, but that's just, I guess. That is possible, but it was this, um, but he was talking about how it was this kind of this incredibly strange and uh, it, it made it difficult for him to relate to other people uh, that he was around because he kind of had this, you, they've seen me shit, I've seen them shit. Uh, I've seen them uh, use their anus, they've seen me use my anus. Um, and the, I, I guess we'll, we'll uh, this will make more sense when we talk about capitalism, the family, and, a, and the anus, chapter four. Uh, we spend an entire week talking about buttholes. Um, not an entire <laughs> week, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna spend most of my life thinking about buttholes. But, uh, that's besides the point. That's valid. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, do do either do any of you three, uh, exit Iris or Estudia, have anything to say about this last paragraph? See, I have not read uh, in De Luz and Guattari, uh, so this is this bit was off. Uh, like, I have to admit, was a bit confusing to me. So, um, I think so. I understood some of these words. <laughs> I don't know what any of them mean together. Um, I mean, do you have any questions you want to ask? Because I think I have a decent enough grasp on the paragraph that I might be able to help you out, but I think I might okay. need some prompting. Um... So, so I'm assuming when he says uh, like something like great social machines, he's talking about things like uh, the army, the school, the church, sport, etc. Um, me, 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 me. Uh, I would say that the great social machine, I believe, would refer to, like, the sort of sum of all the different social machines. And that, okay. like, yeah, family, church, school, spo- or the army, school, church, the sport, um, those are in- those are sort of individual social machines. Hear me now? Yeah, we can um, hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, okay, I just want to say that this that second to last sentence about um, army, school, church, sport, that's... Like society is saying to him, "You're gay," and he says, "No, you." <laughs> that, is a, that is a that is a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, to me, like, uh, my greatest experience would be with uh, like short time playing sports when I was a, a bit younger, and then obviously school. And that um, the the greatest like experience I've ever had with homophobia was at school, especially when I was younger. In which, like, between sixth and eighth grade, where, like, calling somebody, um, you know, like, slurs and, um, like, saying other people are gay as, like, an epithet um, was sort of the most prominent in my life. Yeah, uh, and so, for me as well. Yeah, and, and this is the, the period in my life in which I sort of, like, developed, the, like, the greatest sort of, um, I, I want to say, like, fear about being identified as, like, gay at that point in time, because I was, like, relentlessly bullied uh, for being gay, even though I, at the time I didn't identify as such. Uh, and and so, like, this is, like, to me, like, I think is an interesting bit. I'm not sure how to make sense of it. Um, but that the idea that schools are, are, and, like, the army and such are, are repressive institutions of, like, homosexuality, it, it's definitely something to me that rings true. Yeah. And I think and I think he's kind of stabbing at the sort of the latent homo the the latent homosexuality the sort of unsaid homosexuality that undergirds all of that. Like, I mean, I was I did sports for a little while, and it is this kind of weird thing where it it is there is like a little bit of like a sort of like unsaid homoeroticism, you know, sort of sort of there Absolutely. that a lot of people that most people are fighting, um, you know, in, in the locker room or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, 
I don't know. I actually I spent this... a lot of time in a uh, marching band where it was rather than latent homosexuality, it was patent homosexuality. It was very, uh, very <laughs> open and celebratorily, celebratorily gay. And I don't know. I'd be curious to reflect on those uh, those experiences in this context uh, at a later time. Yeah. Um, I think like, for instance, in sport, like, it, like, okay, at school in P was like the only time in which you were, it was a like, socially acceptable within the school setting, like for you to be naked around other, um, other boys. Cause I was, you know, raised as a boy. And so like, this was like, I, this was something where like, it was like, almost like it was so, um, it was like this unspoken fear of either being, you know, looked at naked which for me i was more um at that point in my life ashamed of my body like for reasons of like weight but also like the fear of being caught or perceived of as looking at, at looking at other people naked like and then being bullied for that or being like sort of like um shamed and excluded for that and so like all of these sort of aspects of um these sort of like things which are like sort of uh, identified with homosexuality are present there um and so it becomes even the tension and the repression has to has to sort of scale with that if that makes sense yeah that does make sense i i believe i i believe i i, I see where you're coming from it's it's almost as if it sort of has to it has to recognize the danger <laughs> like the the repressive system has to recognize the danger in these sort of um these sort of moments and sort of scenarios, which are so um, intertwined to what that repressive mechanisms re re that a re repressive mechanism defines as like homosexual, that in those situations it has to um, like the rep the repression has to come out most patently, I should say, like if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, that that, that does make sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah the yeah yeah um all right um unless exit iris Athadia, unless you have anything else to add um i think we can we can sign off i'm way too sleepy i'm hungry i haven't eaten anything it's except three three thirty in yeah. the morning. We'll try it's to do this in the we'll try to do this in our afternoon so you're not staying up until midnight next time. Exit. <laughs> Thank you. Try to be try to be Yeah. Um although I guess we can't go too early because you Asadia and Iris, you guys are is is it Pacific time or or Central? I'm... What was that? I'm Eastern. Oh, you're Eastern. I'm Mountain. You're Mountain. Well, I'm Arizona time. So. Yeah, I didn't know if Arizona was Pacific or Mountain or Central or whatever it's called. So it's weird because we don't have daylight savings times. So certain times of the year we match up with Pacific or Mountain, but I forget what what it is now. But I want to say right now it's um, it's Mountain. It's Mountain. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. Daylight saving time is just fucking ridiculous. Um. That's a yeah. Point. All right. I'm gonna end the recording now.